Hi everybody, my name is Rhonda Denny and we are live Facebook. I want to thank my camera woman, Danae Hay. She's behind the camera. Say hi. Hi everyone. She's shy today. She didn't want to come in front of it. I don't blame her. There's days when I don't either. But I'm not today. You're stuck with me in front of the camera today. And I must admit that this is going to be a blast today. I'm really looking forward to it. And also, we couldn't do this without Linda Winner. And she can't say hi because she's online. She's going to handle our questions. And so feel free to ask questions. She's going to try to handle as many as she can. And I suspect that she can handle 99% of them because she knows what she's doing. But if there's a question that she says Rhonda needs to answer, then she's going to let us know. And Danae will let me know and we will answer your questions. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to see if I can see us live here. Okay, so today we are talking, and by the way, my name is Rhonda Denny. This is how you can contact me. It's Rhonda at RhondaDenny.com, and my website is www.RhondaDenny.com. There's no space, and my last name is spelled D-E-N-N-E-Y. Sometimes people forget the E, and you won't find me. Okay, so for those of you who are participating and have the kit from Martelli, you're all set. For those of you who are just watching because you're interested in this, you can follow along, but you won't have the materials that we have. Um, the only way you could get them was to order them from Martelli, and that included um, a panel, and you had a choice between the Eagle and... This is what I call spirit, but it is basically a quote from the Bible, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And I just thought it was beautiful, but actually, to be honest, when I created this piece, I had the fabric picked out first, and then I had to find just the perfect thing to do with it, and it was that verse. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. But before we get to the panels, there's some things that I wanna talk about and some workshops that we're gonna do when we talk about free motion stitching. And so some of you may be absolute beginners with free motion and you're scared to death. Don't worry about it. We're going to have some fun. And the thing to realize is when you are using anything new, so, so just think back, and I'm hoping that all of you can identify with this, but if you've ever rode, learned to ride a bike, so you might have started with training wheels or you might have started with someone holding the back for you to give you assistance and then you worked up and then all of a sudden, whoa, you were riding that bicycle and things were just fine. So feel that and also identify with it and know that today I'm gonna try to give you some training wheels to start you off and then we're gonna progress forward. Now everybody learns at their own pace and don't, please do not feel pressure that you have to get this the first time. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, <laughs> I am not a sewer. Uh, I, I actually was more of an, I was in information technology when I did my technical career growing, uh, actually afterwards, when I, when I grew up and left high school. But in high school and grade school, I always dabbled in art. I loved doing that. But I uh, decided that that wasn't the career that I wanted. My dad influenced me a lot there because he said, you need to get a job that pays. And so I said, okay. So I went for information technology and I had a really enjoyable time there, but I always used art as a way of helping me relax. And so I have a little bit of a different background than some of you may, but my point here is that it doesn't matter what your background is. What we're doing is we're learning some tools and some techniques that will allow you to discover and create things using your own voice. And when I say your own voice, we all have a desire to express ourselves. And one of the things that I love about fabric and quilting and free motion stitching is that no matter if everybody's doing the same pattern, they look different because people choose the fabrics that they use. They use uh, different techniques to put them together and to finish them, including stitching. <clears throat> so it allows you to add a little bit of yourself to it. And you probably know the feeling when you have done something that you are just so proud of. That is the exciting thing about doing this. It's a creation process. 
And so what I'm doing in my mind is I'm a mentor today and I'm going to show you some ways to add um, some different techniques to allow you to create some dimension to some of your pieces. And that's including free motion stitching. Now the ideas and the concepts that I'm going to present today can be done hand stitching as well. These concepts are the same, but because I'm not a sewer, and I will admit that I've done a little bit of hand embroidery and things like that, but um, for whatever reason, it's not my bag. I prefer using a sewing machine. And um, to be perfectly honest, I started out doing, uh, learning how to quilt because I saw a, a kit in a catalog and I said, oh, wouldn't this be fun to put on our bed? And so my neighbor uh, was actually, uh, a very good quilter and she made the mistake of telling me that she'd help me so I don't think she rused that day but she and I had a lot of fun because I took this kit that I purchased and it was um, round the world pattern it was gorgeous hand-dyed uh, blues and purples and greens which are my favorite colors and uh, I, I actually ended up calling the the quilt trip around the Rockies but I added some applique on the edges but when I first started quilting, I wanted to do all of it myself. So it took me several years to finish this thing and actually quilt it. And I did finish it. Uh, I don't know that I want to show it to anybody. It's not definitely not something that you could enter in a show, but it was such a journey and a wonderful reminder of where I came from. So I continued trying to learn how to piece quilts and blocks. And I got so darn frustrated because none of my stuff came out the same because I was never consistent. So it made me realize, and that's the other thing, when we do something and we, uh, we just don't seem to get it, it may be because that's not quite the voice that we want to use. And so um, I always like taking classes and I love learning. So what I do is I take a class and then I have in the back of my mind, okay, how can I use this myself? Obviously, when you're taking a class from someone and you have a pattern, you need to follow the pattern so it at least looks somewhat like what your end result is supposed to look like. But you can then take that, what you've learned, put it in your toolbox, and then apply it in your own way in your own work. So many of you love piecing. Uh, you love the traditional quilting and I have a lot of respect for what you do, but it's not mine. I, I just don't, I can't be consistent. None of my seams come out the same. So I was drawn to art quilts. And as you can see behind me, these are some of my pieces that I've done. And I have used my stitching techniques to, in addition to fabric and pigments and stitching to create my piece. And so what I'm teaching you here today can be used either in a traditional quilt, if you wanna just add some extra oomph to your quilt and make it your own, or you can go and explore and start doing some art quilts. And by the way, I do teach other workshops. I, I really wanna thank Martelli for offering me this opportunity to do this Stitching for Dimension workshop and the fact that they have the kits that are available for us helps make it easier for you. And I just love the fact that they are giving us a ruler in our kit. And we'll talk more about this in, in the workshop um, a little bit later. I'm gonna go through what, what we're here, but I'm gonna finish my introduction. But these are instrumental in helping you sew easier. And either using them as a ruler when you're cutting with a, with a rotary cutter, or using them when you sew. So these are very, very versatile. And I mentioned um, that we also have other tools from Martelli. These are the quilting paddles. They've got the little palm paddles and they have the hoops. And if you don't have these, it's okay. You don't need them necessarily, but you will need some sort of a glove that kind of has, the, and they call them quilting gloves, but they have a little bit of sticky on them so that you can hold the fabric and move it because you are, the one running the fabric through the machine instead of having the dog, the feed dogs down. And we'll talk more about that later too. But all of these things will help you when you're quilting. And if you don't have them now, you may wanna learn how to do it and then decide later that yes, I wanna invest in something like this to help me. But don't worry about it if you don't have it today. It's not a showstopper at all. 
Okay, so so basically I am what I call a fiber artist or an artist. Um, I also consider myself an educator and a mentor. I love teaching people new techniques and I love watching the light bulbs go off. I just think it's so neat when people realize, oh, I can do this and you don't have to be an artist to do this. There are some basic concepts and people who may have a background in arts may have a little bit of an edge on you, but not really. They just maybe pick it up a little faster, but I would bet that you have some edge on them in other ways. And so all of this will come together. All right, so basically free motion stitching is, um, it's actually sort of a, a in the middle between a sewing machine moving your fabric and hand stitching. So you're using the machine to create the stitches, but you are the one that is guiding your fabric to, uh, to put the stitches where you want them to go. And so this will come better with a little bit of practice. And so what we're gonna do today in this workshop is provide you with some exercises and we're gonna get you going and you will have the opportunity here to um, review this, uh, this live. It'll be, it's being recorded now and it will be then uploaded to YouTube. And because you purchased a kit, Martelli will give you access to it so you can go back and review things. So if I cover things a little too fast for you, please don't get frustrated. Just relax, take a deep breath and enjoy yourself. And if you, one of the things I recommended was that if you had extra fabric and batting that you create some other um, practice pieces so you can practice. And don't move on to something if you don't feel comfortable, unless you wanna try it. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I'm hoping that everybody has, who, at least those who purchased the kit, have these materials. And the first one that I had in there was the description and supply list. And it, uh, it tells you what all you need. So this live Facebook uh, workshop is gonna have a lot of hands-on right here where we're gonna use my workshop sheets, but then we're gonna go over to my sewing machine and we are going to actually sew and I'm gonna show you what you need to do. So it's gonna be two different platforms that we're gonna work. Okay, so uh, in addition, I asked you to make copies, extra copies. And so if you haven't done so, you might want to because you probably only have one master of these that Martelli sent you in your kit. So it, it would behoove you if you could make copies uh, so that you can draw on these worksheets and then keep the originals in case you want to practice some more. The other thing that's included is a, depending on the panel that you picked, you have a worksheet for each of the um, panels. Actually, these, I'm, I'm going to use the eagle today, so I've got some extras of those that I made, so I will use those with you. So, if you have the copies, perfect. Now, the other thing that you can do, and this is actually for the benefit of those of you who didn't see my reminder live earlier today or go back and look at it on Facebook. These are the kinds of things that I covered there, but I wanna cover again, just in case. Um, when we work on our worksheets, you need, you should have some, a pencil, some ink pens or some markers. I am gonna use a red pencil today so you can see what I'm doing. If you wanna use a red pencil. Another thing you can do if you don't have a way of making copies of these worksheets is you can take a plastic bag, cut it, fold it out, lay it on top, and just give you an idea what that's going to look like. So if you have your worksheet, can you zoom in a little, Deanne? Or actually, um, why don't you hold on? I'm going to have Deanne move a little closer when I actually work on the worksheets themselves, but I, we're going to keep her where she is for now. But so just to give you a general idea of what I'm doing. So you have your worksheet. If you, and this was, you cut it so that it's a single ply and you lay it on top and then you mark on it. And that allows you to make markings and get an idea what you want and not, um, not write on your master. So that's another alternative for you. Another one that you can do if you have the materials, <clears throat> when I worked, we used, uh, we did presentations a lot of the time and these are what they call uh, transparencies, or we call them foils. I don't know where that came from. But anyway, these are just pieces of plastic that you can lay on top of it and draw. Now, 
If you want to use the same concept for other projects of yours, you can um, do, do the same thing. So because of the size of these panels is large, you might want to take a picture of it and then turn it into black and white, but you'll always have your original to refer to, and then make it, print it out on an eight by 10 and use that to practice, to figure out what kind of stitching you're gonna do. And we'll talk more about that later. But if you have something like this or some plastic bags and you haven't done your copies of your worksheets, those are some other ways that you can make it, take advantage of using these. Okay, a couple of other things that we're gonna get ready before we go into the worksheets themselves is whatever panel you picked, you know, I want you to get it out of the packaging and um, you don't necessarily have to do it right now. These have been folded, so they have crease lines, but if you lay them out, they'll relax a little bit, the, um, or you can iron them. And one of the reasons that I'm suggesting this is because sometimes those little bumps kind of frustrate you when you're trying to, to, um, to actually do free motion. So the flatter, the less wrinkly your fabric is, the better. And there are other ways that you can sandwich these together using, uh, basting spray and pins that can kind of help you spread them out and, and have them so that those aren't there. If you're not careful, you could get a wrinkle and sew the wrinkle into your piece, and I don't think you want to do that. So one of the two panels that you have, get them out and get them open. The other thing that you have in your package, your kit, is batting. You have a big piece that's just the right size for our panel, so you might want to get it out and let it you can actually iron this flat as well. And then you have some backing material. And I'm gonna choose a dark green today for mine so that you can actually see the stitching. That's the advantage to using a dark background fabric. Okay, and I think you have a light, you have a, a light one, but whatever color it is, it can be any color. I just wanted you to be able to see um, your stitching so that you can gauge what's going on. The other thing that you have is this practice piece. And this is what I'm recommending you make more of so that you are ready if you want to, to practice more. So this one's very nice, very generous. It's actually an, um, a full piece folded in half with batting in the middle. So it's plenty of room for us to practice today. But again, if you want more practice, make another one and you are set to go. And we'll talk later about how you secure those. Okay, so the other thing that I want you to do is make sure that you have your thread and I would recommend winding at least three bobbins using this thread. So there should be plenty of thread on the, on the spool for three bobbins and whatever we're gonna do today. So the idea of having three bobbins, it gives you uh, peace of mind that you're not gonna run out of thread in your bobbin. Now it all depends on your machine. I don't know what machines you have, but I always like to have extras of these so that when you run out of thread, you don't have to worry about rewinding that bobbin or winding another bobbin. So you've got some extras that are in, in reserve. Um, this is superior thread, so fine, and it's, it works just fine in the top and the bottom. So the bobbin and the top of the machine, and that's why we selected it. Uh, I had mentioned that I was gonna talk a little bit more about the colors of threads that you should use. And I'm gonna wait to do that when we start quilting. Okay, uh, for now, I just want you to know that if you can or haven't done this already, please do so because it'll make your life a little easier when we start sewing. One of the things that really frustrates me when I take a class is I don't have everything prepared. I don't really know what I'm supposed to prepare. And so I go and there are some people who are just so organized and they are, they're just like sitting there saying, okay, I'm ready. And I'm sitting there saying, okay, where did I put my scissors? Where's my thread? And I'm sitting here trying to grab things. And that frustrates me so much. And I really don't want you to have that because that takes away from the learning experience. And then I'm so focused on where's my bobbin and where's my thread that I am not paying attention to what people are doing. And normally workshops have a natural flow to them. And so we will get there. It's just, an, uh, it's a recommendation that you have these done ahead of time so you don't go through that stress because this is not the purpose of this workshop. I don't want to stress you out, <laughs> okay? All right, so um, 
Let's see here. So I have an information sheet, and I will refer to this here. I'm going to have Deanne move here pretty soon so she can get a, a close-up of what I'm doing here. Um, let me see. Oh, and I wanted to mention, too, that because of COVID-19, I wanted to do something fun. And I have another worksheet here of toilet paper. <laughs> and I think when I think of 2020, this is the first thing that comes to mind, a shortage of toilet paper. So I said, you know, wouldn't that be fun? So we're going to use this as one of our worksheets, too. So this is the COVID-19 worksheet. Okay. Um, I think, uh, Linda, I hope you've answered any of the questions that people have. Have you been seeing anything, Deanne, that I need to answer? Not at this time. All right. Thanks. So again, if you have any questions, hopefully there's not anything too scientific so far. Okay, so Deanne is gonna actually come over and move her camera. Here she is. So I'm gonna get back here so she can focus on me so you don't see my messy studio. <laughs> <laughs> I did clean up a couple of little spots for this. There she goes. And Deanne, I really appreciate you doing this for me. No she problem. Pro. Yeah. Okay. Little jiggly, though. <laughs> That's all right. When you get here, you'll stop and it'll be just fine. Okay. So, as long as you can see me and the worksheets. All right. So, let me talk a little bit about this worksheet right here. And again, I'm going to refer to it, but you should have a copy of this in your kit. Um, it's really talking about just adding stitching to your piece not only binds the sandwich together, but it actually can add to your design. And a lot of times when I'm doing a piece, I know that I'm gonna add additional things when I do my stitching. Um, it can either be a traditional quilt or an art piece. So you can either do it by hand or by sewing machine. And uh, free motion stitching is my preference, but it doesn't mean that you, you can't do it with a regular foot. It just means you have to move that quilt around a lot. And actually, Martelli's rulers work really well for doing straight lines, if that's what you want to do. We do have a question. Can we increase sure. the volume? Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Let's see if we can increase the volume. Let me see here. Like so? Oh, yeah. And then just move it here. Got it. Okay, let me see if I can increase the volume. Hmm. I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. I'm kind of new to this. Linda. Oh, okay. Her volume's great. Okay, well, I've had one person say that if I can increase the volume some. can Okay, Beth, can you try to increase the volume on your device? I don't know if you're using a phone or you're using a computer or a laptop or an iPad. Try increasing it on your end. I'm actually using an AirPod, so I should have pretty good volume with this. It's when the camera person is across the room. Oh, well, but I'm, I'm speaking right here, so I don't know. But anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, it, try increasing it on your end, and then uh, it sounds like we've got several people that it's okay for them. Okay. I don't want to take detract from your learning experience here. Okay, so um, the basic concepts here are to add stitching to help define shape. Now, if you, if you have a, a piece that doesn't have necessarily uh, specific shapes, you can add stitching to help make it interesting. And I can talk about that a little bit later. So the amount of stitching will depend on the size of the piece or the components within it. Now, a lot of times when you are doing quilting, you're actually going around things to help secure them to your quilt but when I do that, I also like to add a little bit of um, stitching to kind of add some dimension and make it pop. Now, the concepts here when we talk about quilting is the more you stitch, it pushes back. The less you do, it comes forward. And that's the same idea here. So that's, that's what this is all about. And shading on an element helps with dimension. And what I do is I combine using my pigment technique my pigment patchwork technique and stitching, and I'll show you that on a few things. So if you do have something that has dimension, and I know there's some beautiful quilt designs that do have dimension, 
based on the fabric that's being used. And if you added stitching to enhance that even more, it would really make them pop. So there's some whole concepts when it comes to that. And I'm really talking about some of the basics here, but you can do some more research with, this, with these basics under your belt and play and see what happens. And so what I've been told is a lot of times people, especially those who win awards at quilt shows, a lot of times they spend several hundred hours figuring out what they want to do and practicing before they even work on their masterpiece, which is why they create a masterpiece. Okay, uh, and you can also get different effects by the color of thread. So if you're doing an overall quilting on something, they recommend you use a neutral color. Uh, if you want something to really pop, if you use a contrasting color, that helps. But what's interesting is, even if you use a contrasting color, if you do an overall quilting on it, it does tend to kind of recede into the fabric. So uh, you'll just have to experiment because it depends on so many factors. It depends on the colors of the fabric that are in your quilt. It depends on the pattern that you're using. And in this case, it will depend on the type of stitching that you're using. So you just want to play. And what I really, what makes me excited is that gives you so many different opportunities to really develop and create your own voice. And as I said earlier, you can make it unique not only by the fabric colors you pick, but also by the stitching that you choose to use. So a couple of examples here. We have a rounded form. Do I need to move this or no? Okay. We have a rounded form here, a circle, a circle of fabric. I could either quilt all the way around it and just leave it be. If I quilted heavily around it, it would pop it up but maybe I want it to look like it's actually got some dimension. And here, this is just supposed to represent the type of stitching you want to do, is to actually make it look like it's rounded. And then if you want to do even more stitching, you can do some around the edge and then maybe, uh, depending on the size of these. Now, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is because if this is a relatively small piece of fabric, let's say this is the actual size of that piece of fabric, you don't wanna do uh, a tremendous amount of stitching on it unless that's what your intent is. But if you have one, let's say this circle is like three inches wide or six inches wide, you're gonna to have to do more stitching in it or it's gonna really pop, now, unless you want the trapunto effect. So if you don't stitch on it, it's definitely gonna pop because of the batting that's underneath it. And if you don't want it to do that, you can actually do stitching around to kind of press the whole thing down. So experiment and figure out what it is that you want to do. Same for a cylindrical form. So here's a cylinder and it could just be a piece of fabric. Uh, you could have added some pigments to make it look a little bit more dimensional with shadowing. But here's some ideas. And again, all the things that I'm presenting today are ideas. There's no one set way to do any of this. I'm just giving you some suggestions for things that I might do but you are gonna do whatever you wanna do. This is for you to help discover your own voice and develop skills and techniques for you to explore your own voice and your creativity. So if I came along and I did stitching along the edge, I, I'm gonna start having it look more cylindrical or I could actually do stitching all the way around it. So there's, these are actually two different philosophies here. Um, and for small pieces, I, you could either do it either way. Um, one of the things about doing it, this technique, is you're gonna have, depending on the type of batting that you're using in this piece, you may have a lot of loft here, and it may look really puffy. And, and as a matter of fact, one of the first quilts I did where I did this kind of thing on my faces, I had children in it, and I didn't like how it came out because it made them look old. It made them look like they had wrinkles, and I didn't like that. So now, a lot of times, depending on the size, I will do dimensional stitching kind of around the curves of the face. And I, I'll show you what I'm talking about on some of my pieces. Okay, so I'm gonna show you here. <clears throat> and on this worksheet, I took the organic forms. Uh, these, these are probably um, more what I would see in some of the things that I do because I do more organic or realistic types of pieces. But let's say you have a flower. And I did this in blue so you could kind of see it. 
but I want the, the center of the flower to kind of push in. So I just did some stitching around it. And on the petals themselves, you could just go around the edges. And what that will do, especially if you start doing quich, uh, quilting on the outside, let's say you followed it up with some, you know, some echo quilting around it. This will be pushed back. These will be popped up. If you don't like that. So another reason uh, that we're looking at these different concepts is you can start with one way and do some stitching. Let's say you're gonna go ahead and stitch all the way around all of your forms so that you're defining them. And then you say, you know, I want a little bit more de definition with this. So then you can add more stitching. So the, the challenge is it's harder to take away stitching than it is to add it. And so, um, unless you use the uh, dissolvable thread on the back, but then it all goes away. <laughs> but um, I start out by doing an amount and then I say, okay, what would happen? And I may have played on something else uh, and I, I decide, okay, I wanna do some more stitching to kind of define the veins that you see in the petals of a flower. So it's really whatever you wanna do. Now let's look at a leaf. So this is a leaf and just quite naturally, you could do stitching along the vein, the main vein, and then the small veins on the leaf, and then around the edges. And that may be all you wanna do. Or you could go in and add even more definition of the, more, the smaller veins in it, and you could uh, actually add some more around the edge. It's totally up to you. But here's the idea. Okay, so the first exercise that we have is taking your worksheet, and I want you, let's get this off here. I would like for you to use your pencil or use your plastic, whatever marking that you wanna do. And I want you to take a few minutes and play, okay? So the idea is you don't necessarily have to do dash, dash, dash. You can just draw lines, because you know that's gonna be your stitch, okay? So for example, just start drawing. And don't feel bad about, uh, oh, I can't, it doesn't look so good. That's another reason why if you have extra worksheets, you can, you can play with them until you get comfortable. Now, uh, free motion is almost like drawing, but you're drawing with the needle and thread on your machine. So the more you practice doing the kinds of stitches that you want, the more natural and easy flowing it's gonna be on the machine. And that is one of the other key things that makes the stitching look better. Now, some machines have these stitch regulators, uh, which help, but some of them don't. And I personally prefer no stitch regulator because I wanna be able to control. Uh, but I will tell you the quilt police might come get you, or they won't get you, but they won't, they will, chastise you a little bit about your stitch length. And unfortunately, uh, many of my pieces that I've entered in quilt shows come back with, watch your stitch length. And I say, yes, I, I am. And I want them to be that way. So I have always learned now to take the feedback because it's graciously given and they usually are just trying to help you, but take it with a grain of salt. What is your intent? And quite honestly, I don't know that I can compete with some of these, these uh, award winners, but that's okay, because that's not my intent. I'm creating pieces to, to uh, share my voice, <laughs> that's it. If I win an award, even better. But I'm, I actually look at it as the joy of doing it in the moment, and that's when I'm really enjoying and having fun. Okay, so we'll, let's take a few minutes and have you all just play a little bit. So I'm gonna leave this here and um, I'm gonna give you, let's, let's take about five minutes and let you practice. And so if you wanna do one worksheet and then do another, uh, feel free. So the idea is play with different things. Let me just show you something here. So like on the flower, you don't necessarily even have to be realistic either. So let me just grab this. You could just do a stitching here and just do an echo stitching on it. But also, I just wanna point out, don't forget the background. Now, if I did this and I didn't do any quilting on the background, this is gonna be pushed in or move away and the background's gonna come out. So 
whatever you do on the object, you need to actually realize what's going to happen on the background. So you could do a meandering stitch, or you could actually do some fancy stuff. This is where you play. And another thing that I don't really care about is that I cross lines. I will cross my stitch line. I don't really care. So take a few minutes and play. I'll give you, a, let's, let's go for like five minutes. If you have any questions, just, we should be good to go. All right. So a little bit later, I'm gonna show you some of my pieces and talk to you a little bit about how I use stitching. Oh, we got somebody from South Africa. My goodness, Mavis. <laughs> I'm taking a peek at some of the comments so I can see what's going on. Oh, welcome everybody. We have 56 live. That's amazing. I'm so glad you all joined. Now, for those of you who are watching, let's see, Linda. Oh. So Linda's saying somebody else is replying as Martelli. Oh, well, good. It's teamwork. St. Croix. Wow, Debbie. Great. So uh, I was going to mention, some of you may be watching the live Facebook, uh, but you don't have the, the kit. One of the things, if you want to get it, you can order it from Martelli. And um, I'm sure they're going to, when they post it to Facebook, they'll have some information. I did an earlier, uh, oh, we need to do another. Oh, someone said we need to do one in South African St. Croix. I would go. Oh, probably not right now. <laughs> Deanne would go. <laughs> By the way, Deanne is a member of my quilt guild here in Emporia. Oh, Karen, you did get your, so Karen was at the Quirky Quilters Retreat and she did a beautiful job and she said she framed hers. And I saw pictures of it, it's just gorgeous. All right. Well, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't uh, make a note of when we started to do this. <laughs> so I don't know for sure if it's been five minutes. So does anybody need any more time? Are we ready to move on to the next worksheet? Yay or nay, give me some thumbs up if you wanna move on. If you need more time, don't worry about it. Oh yeah, uh, you're, so you're talking about the picture of the finished quilt, the framed one, yes. Actually, she could attach it if she had it handy. And by the way, everybody, <clears throat> I do have um, a PDF that outlines some of the other workshops that I teach, and I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to attach it to this. And then I also have a, another PDF that shows you all of my available panels, and they're all uh, based on pictures of my work. And they're really fun to use if you want to practice free motion stitching. And they are available. Uh, you can get them from me. Okay, looks like people are getting are all set and ready to continue. Is there anybody that says, no, please don't move any further ahead. I'm not done yet. If I don't hear any squawking, I'm going to continue. Give you a couple of seconds to reply. So this is kind of an interesting way of doing a workshop, and I'm actually enjoying this. It's not quite the same as seeing you in my, in my physical presence, but this isn't too bad. I'm very impressed with the technology we have today. Okay, I haven't heard anything from anybody else, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. So uh, if you want to, you can do other objects. You can just, there's a, actually what's really fun is if you find a coloring book, Coloring books are great for doing this kind of thing. Take a coloring book 
and make copies of it and use that as your worksheet and start, that would give you an opportunity to practice doing stitching. Okay, let's do our famous COVID toilet paper roll sketch. Okay, so I've given you four of these. You don't necessarily have to make another copy of this to use, but I, cause I've given you four of them. So with a toilet paper, now, realize too that this toilet paper could be multicolored. You should have some very fancy because it if you if you found toilet paper at the at that point in time <laughs> when we didn't have any anywhere, um, you could have had some very pretty toilet paper. But what we want to do is take this and let's say this was pieced together, or it could just be one piece of fabric that was cut out in this shape. We want to add lines that will define our toilet paper roll. And so one of the things that I'm thinking of right away is you could actually, well, first of all, you would want to go ahead and outline the whole thing with your stitching. And I'm kind of, I would be more careful to try to follow this better. But, and then the other thing too is that, um, okay, there's always talk about, okay, continuous stitch line. And I'm not really worried about that so much as long as you bury your thread ends because you don't want those sticking out. You can always go back over your lines, travel over them, which is another reason why you want to be careful when you're actually stitching pieces that you try to be precise. But after we've done that, what we could do is we could come here and do some stitching to kind of represent this roll of toilet paper. Like so. Then, when you see this, this uh, the sheets coming off of it. Well, you've over here on the on the roll itself. You could actually do some. So you come back. You're you're stitching. Just so use your pencil to follow how you might stitch this, back and forth, back and forth. See how that's already giving it some definition. So I want to come over here and do the same thing. And then I might want to, and actually when I do this a lot of times, I will not do them all the same like I used a ruler or something. I might come in and do some longer ones, but you can always go back and do this. And then come down here. So I am kind of doing a continuous stitching with this, but I don't necessarily worry about it so much. So what do you think? And then you might even want to come back in here and do some more like that. Or you could come over here and then if you wanted to, you could really put some stitching this way to push, to make it look like the toilet roll itself. So another way you can do it is after you've done the overall um, outline is go ahead and do the whole thing, but do it with stitching that actually follows the contour of the toilet paper roll. Like so. All right. And then you could also follow that up. Sorry, I'm moving it. I don't know if it's helping. But then I could come down here and just do a continuous stitch. So what I'm doing is I'm sort of following the contour. And then if you don't really know, oh, I don't feel comfortable doing this because I don't know what it looks like, go get a live model. Go grab a toilet paper roll and use it as your live model. Like so. Or you may decide, I don't want, I'm just going to outline it. Totally up to you. Okay. So I'm gonna give you a couple minutes and let you do that. And that's, I will start my timer. <laughs> so we'll give you like three minutes. So play around how you might wanna express your voice with a toilet paper roll. Now, one of the other things you could do here is, uh, this could be trapuntoed. So it would really be fluffy and soft toilet paper. <laughs> Now, after we do this worksheet, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some of my pieces and, and talk to you a little bit about what I do. So the first one that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring the actual piece 
here to the table so you can see it. And then the others are, are larger, so I'm going to have to have Deanne move the camera, but we'll leave it here for now. Actually, uh, you might want to, can you, can you have it zoom out? No, just the, the camera. Can you make it here? Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about this piece right here. So back up just a little bit with that. There we go. Okay, and you can actually rotate it some. You can just do this. Like so. Okay, so this is my piece. This is called uh, Clue. And if you ever read, I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember this game, Clue, where it had, you know, Colonel Mustard, uh, Mrs. Peacock and people like that. It was a character and it was a, a mansion that had all these different kinds of rooms and then there was a murder that happened. So you had to figure out who was the character, what room, and what weapon did they use. And in this case, this was a guild challenge that we did and I had so much fun with it. This was, so I, you uh, put your hand in a brown bag and picked out a character, a room, and a weapon and you had to create something inspired by those things. And we had at our quilt show, uh, and this was in uh, Woodland Park, Colorado. And so this is what I came up with. So this is Mrs. Peacock in the kitchen with a rope. And so I really had a lot of fun with it, but I wanted to have it look more like a cartoony character. So instead of using uh, matching color threads, I used black because I wanted it kind of look like a, a picture or a drawing. And so that's what this is. And what's really nice though, is it helps you see what I did with my stitching. So I'm gonna show you the front and I'm gonna highlight some things. And then what I'll do is I'll show you the back because on the back, I tend to use the same color thread, top and bottom. So uh, it just looks better in case I have some of those pesky bottom threads showing or top threads showing. I'm trying to foil the quilt police. So, and again, that's coming from someone who doesn't, as, doesn't have a whole lot of experience with sewing. So, <laughs> all right. So um, I, what I did in this case is I outlined my uh, outside of all my applique pieces. And a lot of times when, when I do my work, I use either raw edge applique or I turn edges. Um, in this, In most cases, it's raw edge because I don't mind the the um, addition of the, the, the edges of the fabric, because to me it adds to the character of the quilt itself. And <clears throat> in this case, my little top feathers weren't even quilted. So you can see that there's not really a whole lot of definition to them, but I do have definition everywhere else. So I used black thread and I first, the stitching that I did as I was securing everything down. And then what I do a lot of times is um, these are some other just tips and techniques for quilting, depending on the size of the piece. They recommend that you then do some overall quilting so that you don't have a, a portion of your quilt that gets so big or the, where you do a lot of dense quilting where it gets so tight that it deforms the quilt itself. And believe me, I have learned the hard way <laughs> where that has happened to me. So the recommendation is when you're quilting something, you do some overall stitching across the whole thing, and then you go in and start adding detail. So in this case, I used black when I was outlining things around my characters, but when I did the background, I used monofilament. And I really like monofilament because it disappears, but it gives you the texture technique. And so if you look closely at mine, I can't remember if I used a blue. No, I used monofilament. I can tell from looking at the back, and it was the, it was the charcoal, the, the smoke monofilament. But I did a few of these just to, to sort of tame the fabric itself. And when I'm quilting, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to your panel, I always make my piece, if I'm having to create something that's a certain size, I always make it larger than what I want the finished piece to be by at least two inches on all sides. Now, some people may say, oh, that's way too many. Well, it all depends on how much quilting I'm going to do because 
The reality is when you quilt, you're gonna condense things. And this way, if I have a set size that I have to finish with, I can crop, I can cut it out when I'm done. And then in addition, if you look at this, um, I have a facing on it. This is called an artist's facing. And you will cut it to the size you want, including this uh, sewing allotment or allowance, the seam allowance for your facing. And then you end up with exactly what you need it to be, okay? Uh, there's a couple of other things that's nice about having the extra fabric on the edges, and that is when you want to travel with your needle in your sewing machine, you can actually come off the edge and travel to wherever you want to be and come back in again, knowing that you're going to cut that away, so it doesn't matter. Um, so, But I try to make it much larger than what I want the finished piece, and then I can crop. In addition to doing it that way, I could perhaps say, well, I want to kind of change the focal point of it and move it one way or the other. So if you feel even more uncomfortable with what's gonna end up happening with it, make it even wider and that gives you more freedom to make those kinds of decisions. <clears throat> so in this case, I first quilted down the big pieces. Then I did some, I, and I came in, because I was using this fabric for my uh, stitching, I kind of followed the pattern on the fabric. I came up and I, did some wide stitching to kind of put it down. On my tabletop here, I did some long stitching so that I could get it down. So everything was secure and I felt comfortable where it was at. Then I started adding more detail. And um, I so here on the colander, you can see that it's got a round shape and hopefully I got that round shape going by having some stitching coming here. Now I could have gone all the way across but because I was using black thread, I didn't want to overpower the colors that were underneath it. If I used monofilament or a different color thread, say I matched something, and in some cases when you're using a multi-tone fabric, it's harder to do that. But in this case, I wanted the lines to look like a line drawing. So I went ahead and just did some of these. And you can see my stitching, I would come in and I'd come back and I'd just come back and forth, back and forth like this. And I also did some on the bottom where you could see where the round part is. And then I came over here and did the same thing on the other side. So a couple of other things that are kind of, um, I didn't really do a lot of detail on the peacock. I just mostly defined the feathers and then I came back and I added some, a little bit more definition of the feathers themselves. So I came and did the center quill part. And then I kind of added some, some lines just to give it a little bit of, um, pizzazz. And then on my feet, I added the feet and made them look dimensional and my little um, claws. On the rope, I was trying to have it look like it was dimensioned. So I, I uh, didn't touch the center of them, but I came and I did some dense quilting here so that I could uh, have it look more rounded. And then I purposely quilted around every piece of the dimensions of the rope so that you could see the individual, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the loop. So you knew that it was not just one piece of rope, it was several that were um, coiled together. Then on some of my other pieces, so my rolling pin, I wanted it to look round. And so I did my dimensions here. This is kind of like what I was talking about for the toilet paper or the cylinder where I did the edges, and I don't necessarily want them to all be the same. You see what I did? And I like this look. I figure if I, if I wanted more, I could come back in later and add them. And down here, because there's more of a shadowy, I carried it up further. I could have gone smaller, but then I would have had all this loose, and I didn't want that. So I was trying not to over quilt it, and I'm not sure if there's any over quilting that could be done. It's just where I decided to quit. And then likewise here on the, on the uh, rolling pin, and then the handle. Um, so for some of the smaller pieces, like on the measuring spoons, I just outlined it. It was enough for what I wanted to do. And then on the, uh, the uh, timer. So for a lot of these things, it was more, it, so it was a depth, it was the difference between whether I wanted it for the texture and dimension or whether I wanted it to look like a line drawing. So there's always, that's what you wanna think about doing. So, and then, and then likewise on the, on the foreground and the background, I just continued and I, I 
I uh, stitch those to kind of push them in the back. We have a question about sure. uh, Luann's asking what weight thread is used. Uh, Martelli replies it's so fine from Superior, but not sure of the weight. Um, hmm, good question. Um, you know, it really, I use all kinds. I, I don't know that. So sometimes when you're piecing, it's sort of important, the thread weight. But when I'm quilting, the idea is that you, if you're doing a thicker thread, you'll get a different look than something that's very fine. Uh, let's see. I don't even know if, if the, okay, it's a 50 weight, three ply. And I picked this one because it's an, a neutral color. Uh, it also would allow you to see your stitching when we were doing the practicing. Um, I And the monofilament that I use, it is a much finer thread. And so the other key thing about that is this, this the weight of your thread will determine the size of your needle as well. And the other thing to be careful is that uh, if you have a certain weight on the top, your bobbin also needs to be compatible with it. Now, I do know that Superior has all kinds of guides for, for what you're trying to do. They make recommendations. But if you have something that's, that's kind of, oh, you want to get me in there? <laughs> if you have something that you uh, are using to sort of give you more definition, there's nothing wrong with um, experimenting. And having, and then if it gets to be too large, you can put your thread in the bobbin. Okay, so now that I've had Deanne move the camera so she's got me in it, I want to show you the back of the quilt. <laughs> Sorry, I should have warned you. Okay, now I want to talk to you about the back because this really helps you see what's going on too. Don't don't pay any attention to these. Those were those were like knots. I just got carried away with my stitching. But here, you can actually see what I did even better. And this is what's always fun. I always enjoy looking at the back of quilts. So that is basically one of them. And I'm gonna show you another one. You just leave it right there. I'll bring, I'll bring the piece to you again. And really, I'm really showing you some of these pieces just to give you an idea of, of the kinds of things you can do. So this one is, uh, was a cherry wood fabric challenge, and I bet you can't guess the subject matter. <laughs> Prints. <laughs> so their challenge was you, you uh, purchased the, the fabric from them, and you were supposed to use it, uh, and you could provide your own white because they didn't have any white. But... This one has a lot of dense quilting on it. And when you look at it, uh, I'm hoping I can point some of this out. This was done in monofilament, so it might be a little harder to see unless you can see the shine of it. But I, on my hat, and I'm not sure I can even show you, on, yeah, I might show up a little bit better on the hat. Let me talk a little bit about the front. Um, he's got a fedora, and I wanted to stitch this is round, so I've got my stitching going back and forth, back and forth like this. And then I, I used my stitching curved here to kind of give it the dimension there. And then on the hat part, um, and then also the band, I've got stitching coming around, and but not all the way. So I could have continued my stitching all the way across, but this is the effect that I liked. So that's another reason why it's nice if you start out with some stitching, and then you uh, make a decision, do I need more? This gives you that flexibility. Uh, then on his face itself, I was using the, the dimensional stitching here. So I wanted his eyes to kind of sink in, but I also wanted them to stand out. So I used my stitching, if you can see it, to come this way, and then hit his ear, and then his cheek, and then his clothes here. So because I did so much stitching on his face, I had to really quilt densely the background to push it back. <clears throat> so you can see that I've got sort of a, an echo quilting here, but very tight, very close. And then also with his symbol, I guess this was his signature. So anyway, when I, when I did this, I did a lot of research about him and that's what I decided to do. So the back is, um, and a lot of times I use uh, monofilament in my top and the bottom, depending on which monofilament I use. Uh, this one looks like I have colored thread in it, but I used a neutral color thread, so you might not be able to see all of the details. Now I have threads on this. I'm surprised I don't have more cat hair. 
My cats like to leave me presents on everything. And whenever I lay something on my table, inevitably they come up and they sit on it. So when I come back, I say, oh, I've got a hairy quilt now. Okay, so can you see where I talked about on the brim where I've got the stitching going back and forth? So it's a mirror effect to what you saw on the front. So this curve of the brim is here and then the hat band is here. And then where I've got my stitching here for his eyes and his cheekbone and then his cheek come in here. And then you can see the dense stitching here in the background. Okay, so now Deanne, let's come over here and look at some of these that are on the wall. So I'm gonna have Deanne come over here. It just turn it and swivel. There you go. Okay, this one is my chameleon. And this was actually at the Houston show. And uh, it was actually at the Martelli booth too. So this one is, I did using a monofilament as well because I didn't want to take away from the beautiful colors of the fabrics themselves. Uh, and this piece is actually sort of a signature um, of my pigment patchwork technique. This is silk noil and I used uh, watercolor and ink tense pencils to create this. And it was all one piece of silk noil, which is a really wonderful nubby silk fabric. It takes pigment really well. And then I applicate it on top of this background. And um, what's nice about using fabric and pigments is you can create something. I, I mean, I don't think I could have found any fabric that would have worked as good as me creating it myself. And so I drew all of these little uh, scales on of my chameleon and I colored them with the pigments. And then when I quilted, I actually quilted around every one of them to let it pop. So I don't know if you can come in and zoom in maybe at an angle, but you can see that they are all, it's just, it's just quilting around the actual little scales. And I'm, what I'm gonna do is see if I can show you the back. And then on the background, I just did a meandering stitch. I don't know. See, the challenge with these are you can't really see the background. So I'm afraid this is gonna be pretty frustrating. So you're just gonna to have to take my word for it. <laughs> but I think that the quilting, the stitching makes this thing really pop. Um, a lot of people just are really impressed with how, the, how it all comes together. And I will admit that that's a commercially dyed background, but I just loved it. Um, I, I've been experimenting with dyeing fabrics and I think that's a lot of fun, but I just, it, this was perfect for this particular project. Okay, so that was my chameleon. And then this one over here, this one was featured on Martelli's catalog a couple of years ago. Actually, it's been a few now. Gosh, time flies. Anyway, this is called Golden Moments. And I wanted to highlight this one because most of my others I didn't show you uh, the difference between my raw edge applique and my, uh, my turned edge. When I do people, I like using turned edge applique because it gives me a smoother finish. But when I do animals, I don't care. So I just use a raw edge applique. And so in this particular piece, this is pigments on fabrics. In fact, the girl herself, her skin tones, this started out as a muslin and I, I colored it all myself. So those are the neat things that you can do with, with um, pigments. And I do teach workshops on how to do that. Then with the dog, I actually have several different, I don't know if you can see them, but I've got several different colors of browns. And then I augmented that with pigments so I could have it look like fur. And the tongue was just a piece of pink. And I added my pigments to give my dimension. dimension. But in this, this is a really good, um, a really good example of using stitching because it really, isn't much of anything without the stitching because it's just pink. I and mean, there was a little bit of highlights and, and uh, dark spots, but it took the stitching to have it come to life. Um, and then my eyes, and then oh, what's really fun on this one is my hair. I like playing with different kinds of fabrics. This one has, and I'm sorry, I don't really know all the different fabric names, but they're uh, like satin, not sateen, but organza. I know organza, you can see through it. And in a lot of cases I use organza because it gives you a really nice light touch. But these are like sat, uh, satin and some other things. And I like those because they kind of added the sheen to her hair. So the beautiful thing is 
stitching adds to your piece. And I'm not sure, again, because I use so much monofilament. And then the background here, I stitched this thing to death. I went in and I stitched and pushed and pushed it back because I didn't want it to look that way. So I'm not sure you can really see very well in the back. So I won't, I won't force you to strain your eyes on that one. And I don't know that any of these others that I have here will show you much. Oh, this one might. Okay, I'm going to use this one too, just because I think you can tell. This is one of my uh, one of my later ones here. This was done from a from a old family photograph, and it's called Rub a Dub Dub. This was actually I'm not going to tell you what year it was because it'll date me. But this is my siblings and my mom and me. I'm in there, and that's me right there. Anyway, we were uh, traveling somewhere and we got by the river and there was this water trough. So we all climbed in it and dad had to take a picture. So at any rate, this one I'm using my stitching. You can see where I've got it on my arms and the faces and here, just to give some dimension. And then the, the, uh, the background or the foreground and the background. And I'm gonna turn it over so you can perhaps see some of my stitching. So in this case, I used the monofilament with a light uh, thread on the in the bobbin and I don't know if you can see but here's a face I didn't do a lot of stitching if it was a bigger face I probably would have add more added more but what's really fun is here you can see the trough the water trough where I've got my stitching coming this way to define the um, the different the particular um, curves of that water trough that metal water trough so, and then I've got um, in the foreground, <clears throat> I actually have some rocks, <coughs> excuse me. So I quilted around those and you can see here that I quilt around them and then push the background back so that they pop out a little bit, but I also gave them some definition as well, okay? So that's what I'm talking about when we talk about stitching for dimension. Any questions so far? Grab a drink of water here. All right. Now let's talk about your panel. Go ahead and just stay there, it's fine. So, as I mentioned earlier, if you got the kit from Martelli, you either chose the Eagle or you chose what I call Spirit. So what would you do when you wanted to um, stitch on these? And um, when I talked to Valerie and Martelli about doing these kits, she wanted one that was, uh, well, she wanted two different ones to give people a choice. And she said, Can, is there one that's more advanced than the other? And I said, no, not really. Because in my mind, when you are figuring out what you want to do with stitching, it's just depends on what you want to do. So, but certain pieces may lend themselves to different types of stitching than others. And so what I'm going to try to do is talk to you a little bit about how you might want to stitch on these things. So again, if you have, oops, if you have the worksheet that came with it, either the Eagle or the spirit, and <clears throat> here it is. I'm going to use this to talk about how you might want to do stitching. And in this case, I'm going to show you using our, our bag. So I'm going to actually just slip this in here. I don't know, is that going to reflect too much? Okay, good. Excellent. All right, now let's talk about the eagle. So um, if you want to do some stitching, and again, that you're doing it on something smaller than the actual image, but I think that the, the memory, the muscle memory will take because you're sort of encompassing the whole idea of what is it you're trying to do. So with something, actually, you know what? I'm going to start first with spirit because to be perfectly honest, the eagle does look a little bit more challenging to someone. I'll cover both of them, but I'm going to start with this one. 
and give you some different ideas on what you might be able to do. So, here's spirit. So the first thing, if I was thinking, contemplating about how would I stitch this? Oh, and, and by the way, the I don't, I do. I'm not sure if I can grab that or not. I'm not tall enough. <laughs> and my, okay, I'll have to get it later and I'll show everybody. That's one thing about being vertically challenged. It does have a little bit of a reflection. It does? Okay. Um, well, unfortunately, is that because of the lights that we have? Yes. Is that okay? There. Well, okay, I'll try to hold it down. Okay, so the first thing that I would, I would think that you might want to do on something like this, and I'm going to use a black marker just because that's what I have. You can use colored markers if you want. But the first thing that I, that I did when I did this is I actually stitched around all of the letters, but you don't have to do that. It's kind of small, actually, although on your panel, so the original of this was a 12 by 12 piece. So when we did it on the panel, it, it got blown up higher, a, a larger uh, piece, and it actually makes it easier for you to sew around the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> but I would, uh, first of all, I'd come in with my stitches and I would come and um, just basically go around And I wouldn't necessarily define all of them. Can you move your hand a little yes, bit? Yes, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm intruding on the picture. So you see what I'm doing? I'm just kind of having the letters pop. You don't necessarily have to cover the whole thing. Something like that. And in fact, in my original piece, I don't think I went inside some of these areas because they were too small. And then you could bury your thread. So one of the ideas is to go around each of the letters if you want, and then come in the background and then stew. And what I did here was I basically just started doing kind of like an echo. And when I talk about an echo, I don't necessarily have it be anything specific. I just like to travel. Another way you can do it is you could come in. And so a lot of times I will sort of incorporate what I'm doing with the background. Don't even go in any more detail, just come around and sort of block it off just so it pops. So can you see the difference where I'm not doing every letter, but I'm kind of having it outlined. Don't forget our comma. And then by coming and continuing and doing your more stitching on the background, you're going to have those letters pop. And especially for something this small, you probably don't have, actually for, for your panel itself, you would have room. But you could just outline it. Because your stitching is not stand by itself. It actually supports the whole thing. And you don't necessarily have to have it be standalone. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so that would be some things that I would recommend. Now, the other thing you could do <clears throat> is take your Martelli ruler and just do some straight lines. Now, another thing I would do is I would come and I would stop and I would continue. But I would do a couple of these things all the way across, because remember we talked before about sort of taming your fabric so it doesn't all bunch up. And you didn't necessarily have to come all the way through these. <clears throat> and then come back later and add more. And when I did that, I would come in and I'd add it again here. And actually this is, this is the point about um, having your, and, and sometimes what I do with this is I actually, um, I stop and I double stitch so it's, it's secured, and then I leave a tail so that I can bury those threads later, and then I just, I just come over and I leave enough so when I cut it, I've got enough to bury. And then I come over here, and then I'll just travel outside the edge and come over here and do this one. Does that make sense? 
So just wandering around your piece so you don't have to uh, stop and cut the thread all the time. So all, anything out here is gonna get cut away. All right? So those are some ideas for that. Now, on the eagle, this one has a little bit more complexity in terms of what is on the actual panel itself. So we have the eagle, we have an American flag, and then we have this mountain in the background, and then we have the sky. So probably the first thing that I would wanna do just to help kind of block the whole thing is come in and outline everything. And again, I'm, I, I could either follow this line or just go straight. When you look at this afterwards, some of the detail that you take in terms of following the lines exactly, it, it doesn't necessarily matter so much. And then I might come outside on my selvage and come here and just try to follow the... So all I'm doing is um, following my outline. Now, when I'm here, if I wanna travel somewhere, maybe what I would wanna do is come up um, and travel up and start doing my sky. So a lot of times I will use my background to help me travel or some object to help me travel to do another part of it. Okay. Just designing what you want. And then I would come back over these stitches here. Okay, that's the fun thing about using panels because they have already, you, you've got lines that you can use for uh, your, your um, stitching. And in, in many cases, you're good to go there or you don't even have to do any more stitching on it if you don't want to. All right. Now you could also then come back in and do the eye or you could add more with the, you know, with the flag stripes. And um, let's look at the actual panel itself. Now what's nice about these is you can actually see the stitching that I did. <laughs> And uh, this one, this is actually was given to a dear, dear friend, and she lives in the Ukraine, and we exchanged quilts. This was from the International Miniature Quilt Exchange, and we each did a quilt. Uh, we met each other, um, had drawn our names, and we got to know each other online, and then we decided that we were gonna do a piece. We decided the size, it had to be smaller than a certain size, and larger than another size. And then we decided what the content would be, what would be uh, the theme. And so we both decided let's do something from our country or something that symbolizes our country. And so I decided to do the bald eagle with the American flag. And then this, this is Cap, Cap Rock. And my business name is Cap Rock Inspirations, LLC. And that's what it's named after, is this is the mountain that uh, we could see from our, um, from our house uh, when I lived in uh, Canyon, outside of Canyon City, Colorado. So that's what my, com my company is named after. And I just thought that would be really neat to do. So I created this with, um, with, this is raw edge applique, and this is again the silk noil, I believe, and I used my pigments to color it. And then I added other fabrics and then used pigments to color those. So this was applique on top of that. And then many of these things, and I'm trying to remember, I believe that I colored the whole background. And I think that cap rock was actually applique on top of that. But I colored the flag, which is why you see some of the blending with it. But I thought it gave it a really neat effect. And then I quilted this with monofilament. Again, I, I really like the use of the monofilament because then I don't have to match colors so tightly. And, um, you know, I had some, some dark brown or black underneath this for the where the... And so my original was actually much larger. And then I, after I finished quilting it, I cut it. And uh, then uh, when I finished it, it became the size that I wanted it to be. So after I've done this point, then what I can do is I could come back in and add more stitching, just kind of following. So what is that, that this eagle has? He's got feathers. 
and they are all facing a certain direction. So your stitching is going to add to the texture. So I'm just gonna come in and stitch. And I don't think you could ever really go wrong. If you didn't like how it looked, you could tear out the stitches and start again. Although if you do that, I recommend that you, and then I would outline the eye to have it pop. Uh, if you do have to pull out stitches, I'd recommend that you um, rinse your fabric and iron it again to get rid of the holes. But don't ever feel bad about wanting to do that. And then I'd come over here and continue this. The other thing when you're doing stitching is you might want to consider, okay, I'm going to start with just a little bit. So me doing this a lot is maybe more than I want to tackle. So maybe instead, if I came here and just did, okay, let's just do a few. And I'll come up here. Okay. So you don't have to do it everywhere. You could just do a few and say, okay, I like that. That's good. I'm going to, I'm done. So you see the difference? Totally up to you. Now on the beak, if you want to do some def definition here in terms of dimension, you could come up and do some stitching here. Another thing that I do when I do my pieces is I use photographs as my reference and inspiration so that I understand that the beak has, a, um, has some curves to it and I understand what those are. And that's what I use to kind of define the lines that I will use when I'm stitching. Something like that. Okay. Is this making sense? I hope. All right. Now on the flag, I would probably come in and I, and so these are, these are wrinkles because it's waving in the wind. I would probably come and outline my stars and I might want to do some stitching because I know that there are some definition here. But again, if you start doing it somewhere and then don't finish it doing the whole thing, it's gonna look funny. So whatever it is that you commit to do, you're gonna to wanna to think about, okay, I've gotta do that over all of it, or it's gonna look like it was unfinished, okay? Oh, a couple of other hints and tips about free motion quilting. Um, you need to take frequent breaks don't get tired and when you're sitting and i'll talk a little bit more about this when we're actually at the machine don't um don't hunch you want to sit back i know because you're going to want to get close because you're going to want to say okay I'm, I'm working close on this but you want to sit back relax your shoulders and have some fun so uh, many people who do free motion stitching will practice not only on something like this before they even start so they have an idea of what pattern they want to do but they will also take their practice fabrics and they will stitch on it. So for example, let's say I wanted to use my uh, back and forth stitching on it, then what I would probably plan on doing is doing that on here to practice so that I feel comfortable that it's flowing. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes here when we get on the machine, but uh, you want your stitching to just be um, smooth, and steady, and the more practice you do, the better. So when we first start, this is why you have this practice piece, we're gonna let you try doing some of these shapes. We're gonna do a circle, and we're gonna let you practice on it and try to add some dimension to it. We'll do a cylinder, and then you can do the, the flower and a leaf, and give you something to practice with. So if you have more of these pieces, then you can say, okay, I wanna do circles. I'm gonna do all circles on this one so I get practice. And I'll have another piece, I'll do all cylinders. The more you do doing that, the more comfortable I think you're gonna be with free motion stitching because you wanna get the natural smooth flow. And we'll talk about that too. But one of the reasons we're doing this is so that you have an idea of the kinds of stitchings that you wanna do. So after you've done your practicing with some of these shapes, including toilet paper if you want, um, we, you can actually try to do some, some flower, I'm sorry, some flowers. You can try to do some feathers, uh, depending on what you want to do. Now for, for your panel with spirit, you might want to try 
Uh, and what's, what you, there's nothing wrong with doing this. You can take a marker pen and draw your pattern on this and see if you can follow it. So if you wanna make sure that you're very precise with it, practice trying to follow lines. So try uh, drawing or writing on this with your marker and then see if you can follow along with the needle and thread. And the more practice you do that way, the better you're gonna be when you actually start on your panel. And that's one of the reasons why I said, you may not get to your panel today, but if you practice and practice, then you will feel more comfortable. And believe it or not, we had some wonderful, I'll back up here. We had some absolutely wonderful results at the Quirky Quilters Retreat in, uh, in uh, Pensacola, Florida. And uh, as, as you saw from the comments, people were able to create these beautiful, beautiful pieces. And they did it in just the time we had. So some people will catch on quick, some don't, but don't worry about it. Please do not compare yourself with other people. Um, and this goes with anything that you do. Everybody has their own pace. We learn at different rates. So feel comfortable that you're doing this for you. You don't expect to be what the other person's doing. And actually it's kind of nice that we're virtual because you can't compare yourself with anybody else. <laughs> you're all by yourself, unless there's a couple of you in the same room. But uh, this is your journey. And uh, another thing that I always tell people is please, please be gentle with yourself. Uh, we're all learning. And the only way we learn is by making mistakes sometimes. Now, I don't say they're mistakes. I say, oops, that was a learning experience. Some days I say, I didn't like that one, but we all learn something from them. And so um, I don't want this to be stressful. I want you to enjoy it and, and have some fun. Okay, so I think we may be ready, but we're not ready to go to the machine yet. We've done our practice. I want you to take a few minutes now and um, use your worksheets with your panel, particular panel, and think a little bit about what it is you wanna do in terms of stitching. And if you've made a couple of different copies, use, uh, use a colored pencil or a pencil or an ink pen and see what you wanna do. And if you don't like that, I, what I would recommend you do is make a couple of different variations and then set them aside. And that's another thing that I do when I'm, when I'm thinking about what I'm gonna do for my pieces, is I say, okay, what do I wanna do? What, do I, what uh, impression do I wanna give? What kind of stitching am I thinking that I wanna use? And then I will draw them out and I'll set them aside and I'll, I'll uh, sleep on it. And I'll come back the next day and I'll say, hmm, which one do I like better? But the other thing that I wanna stress again is when you're doing stitching, Less is better because you can always add more. And so start out that way. And if you look at it, you say, you know, I think I need a little bit more stitching over here and maybe here, and then just add it. But don't be in a hurry to finish it because you could really make a beautiful piece by taking your time. Okay, so let's do your workshops and I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you five minutes and then we'll touch base and see where everybody is. Okay, so why don't you just have it, the camera be over here on the worksheet. Thank you. Oh, another thing I wanted to point out here, with by using this plastic, I have one here that I can keep, and then I can put it in another plastic bag, and I've got another one, so you don't necessarily have to make copies of everything. So here's our two worksheets. So I'm gonna have our camera focus on that. And I'm gonna give you about five minutes. It may take a little longer, but I want you to just try a couple things. Hopefully you all have extra copies or you have plastic bags you can use. And then we'll talk about quilting. Okay, how's everybody doing? Oops, I better get my microphone on. <clears throat> Linda, thank you so much for taking care of all the comments for us. You're doing such a great job. You are a sweetheart. Okay. Oh, come here, tiger. 
We have one of my, uh, come here, over here. Come here, bud. Come here. Let's say hi to everybody. This is one of my cats, Tiger. I'm actually surprised he didn't come down sooner. Yeah. <laughs> He's my supervisor. And I'm surprised Sammy didn't come down too. Ronnie says hi to you. Where's your brother? Huh? Where's Sammy? <laughs> oh, Amy. Okay, Amy says she's got to run. They're getting a hurricane in New England now. Wow. Well, be safe. Goodness. Okay, how's everybody doing on their workshops? Are we about done? All right, if anybody needs any additional time, why don't you just let me know by a comment and we will wait a little longer. So for some of you, if you've already done your practicing, go back and add another, uh, see, see how you would add more lines. Go ahead and start embracing your panel. <laughs> Figure out what you want to do. So after we do this worksheet, I'm going to talk a little bit about getting your panel ready to sew. Now, for some of you who already know about sandwiching a, a quilt together, uh, this will be a review for you. And if you have any recommendations or any tips, you would, you're more than welcome to add them to our comments. I'd love it. Um, as I said earlier, I am, I've been sewing for a few years, but I am not a real expert who's been doing it for 20 plus. And I know there's some people who have some really neat tips and recommendations. <clears throat> and I'd be more than happy to have you share them. It takes a village. <laughs> That's one of the good things about guilds. You always find some really good people there to ask questions to. Okay, I don't see anybody asking for more time, so I think we're about ready to move on to the next step. All right, so, and again, keep those worksheets handy because we will be referring to them when we do the next step when we actually move over to the sewing machine. All right, so, one of the nice things about your kit, Martelli has given you this practice piece and it's all set. Um, this is wonderful, it looks like it's cotton batting and it's just great from the standpoint that it's just grabbing this fabric. So uh, when you are doing quilting, as you all know, the definition of a quilt is three layers. It's gotta be at least three layers. The back, the top, and something in the middle that kind of provides batting or some sort of cushion. And it doesn't necessarily, excuse me, I've got the hiccups. I don't know why. <laughs> Let me grab a drink of water here. 
So it doesn't necessarily have to be batting. I know a lot of my friends, when they're doing art quilts, they use um, felt. But in my, in my mind, you want something that gives you, um, that gives your piece some loft or some give, because otherwise your stitching isn't really going to do much of anything other than hold it together. So what's nice about having different batting, and you can experiment with this, and some people find a type of batting that they just love and they stay with it. Um, I pretty much, I've got some different kinds, and I, I actually just use what I have. Uh, I don't necessarily have a favorite necessarily right now um, because I have some that I, I bought to try and I'm going to use them up before I buy any more. But some of the batting is dense and quite flat to begin with and others are very lofty. But when you do quilting, in fact, I had a friend of mine, she said she got some really fancy high loft, but when she gets hers ready to do quilting, she irons it when she secures them together. And she said that the ironing pressed it down so it didn't have any loft anymore. So it just depends on the kind of batting you use. So she said, you know, why am I spending money for that kind of batting when I'm gonna squish it to begin with before I even start? So uh, you will get used to whatever it is that you, um, that you wanna use. And in this case, um, I wanna talk a little bit about securing your quilt. Um, Spray basting is one way, and that is you would use the spray and you would uh, spray it and then lay it down and, and uh, work all of the uh, wrinkles out. So the idea is when you're quilting, you, want, you don't want to have wrinkles show up and then catch them with your needle and end up with wrinkles in your quilt. And that goes for either traditional quilting stitch in the ditch or anything else. Um, so you need some way to secure it. And one of the things that I learned the first, when I first started quilting was using safety pins. And they make all kinds of fancy safety pins where they've got a little curve to them, or you've got just straight pins. You've got different sizes, but the whole idea here is that you just wanna secure it so that you've got them together. So if you don't wanna use spray basting, you can do this. And I'm not going to go, I, these are small enough that I don't feel like I have to. So I'm not going to do it uh, in terms of the ones that I use. Um, the other thing that really helps is that you let them rest. And so that when you layer them together, they will stay together and not create wrinkles because you didn't iron out the, the uh, fold lines. <clears throat> so for us to get ready to start sewing, we have our practice piece. If you have other practice pieces that you have assembled, you, or you've gotten the materials for them, you wanna get those assembled. And then we need to create our panel piece. So we take our <clears throat> backing. Oh, and another thing about these, um, these panels that I, that I get from Spoonflower, uh, they are, they're washable. And some people, there's a good question about this. So I, there's always two camps. Do you wash your fabric before you start quilting? Or do you uh, wait? Some people, um, their recommendation is that you wait until you're done quilting and then you wash it because then it creates the loftiness and it gives your quilting look. Uh, other people swear by washing it first, get all the extra fabric dye out so that uh, it doesn't bleed. And in my mind, then you just throw a, um, a die catcher? Is that Color catcher. Color catcher. Thank you, Deanne. So those are um, always good to throw in the first time you wash it. Um, many times when I'm doing pigments, I actually take my fabric and I rinse it in warm water because I want to get rid of sizing. The sizing that comes on fabric sometimes inhibits how well it takes pigment. So I use, or I use PFD or prepared for dyeing fabrics. And in many cases, the PFDs are not, there's no color to them. So if I'm using colored fabrics, I will um, rinse them to get rid of the sizing so that I can use them with pigments. So whatever you're gonna do, uh, if you want to, to um, rinse your panels from, that you got from Martelli for this particular kit, uh, you can do that and then iron them dry with the iron. So 
We do our backing and our batting, and then we lay our panel on top. And I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate today with the eagle. You can, actually, I'll probably do both of them, but I want, um, while, our, while we are doing the, um, the exercises, I'll go ahead and sandwich the other one together. Now, this one's a little bigger, uh, and it does have a couple of wrinkles, and I'm gonna leave these in, because I'm gonna show you. That's another reason why and I'm gonna sort of demonstrate it on here before we get on the machine, but, but we have all different kinds of paddles for quilting. And what's nice is with the paddles, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm, I'm actually pulling, I'm able to pull the fabric to have some tightness to it. So when I'm stitching and moving it, I can keep tension on it. And that's another reason why if you have gloves, you need ones that have a little bit of, uh, not stickiness, but grip to them. And garden gloves work really well for that. Um, or you can invest in some fancy quilting gloves. You can also use your ruler that you got from Martelli. And I'm going to actually use mine because I, I wrote on it with the silver. So you can use this to move it. Now, if you are a Martelli fan and you have more than one of these rulers, I would advise you use two of them to kind of hold it the same way. And these are usable. Now, the, the challenge with this is a little bit, these are great if you want to do straight lines because you use it with your foot. Um, but they're thinner than these paddles. And I find that these are easier for me to grip. Um, as I mentioned when I was sort of doing an introduction to the workshop, uh, when I put gloves on my hands, I have cats that come down and visit me, uh, and then I, I have to get, get rid of them. I, I don't get rid of them, but I try to coax them to give me some space so I can do some quilting. And so whenever I pick them up to move them, I get cat hair all over my gloves, and then I get cat hair all over my quilt, which I can probably take off later, but it's kind of a pain. And then also I start uh, getting itchy and I'll have to scratch my nose, which we're not supposed to do with COVID-19 days these days, but I have to take my gloves off and on all the time, or I have to change my thread, or I have to um, re-thread my needle. So I have to take my gloves off all the time, and I love these quilting tools from Martelli. So these small ones are really great. These are the paddles, which work really great, and you can also uh, ha use them this way or you can use them this way and use them as a ruler or even a curve. If you want to do a curve and you're not quite sure how you want to do it, maybe you can use this edge to give you the start of a curve and, and then give you a line to follow. Another thing that's really nice are these hoops and they come with a little notch so you can put them underneath your foot. But they actually, when you lay it onto your quilt and you pull out, you've got tension 360 degree. The disadvantage to these is when you get to the edge of something and you come off it because now you've got a little bit of, uh, you've got some looseness here. Well, that's why at that point in time, I would come here and I would use these because I can hold them or the small ones. So I actually use all of these myself and um, I've splurged and invested in them, but they sure make my life easier. Okay, a couple things I wanna point out here. Uh, my backing is a little smaller than the one that you probably got from Martelli. So I want to be careful that I have enough that is covering the entire panel. It's not so important that, I, uh, that it doesn't cover all of this here because I don't necessarily need to have the backing when I'm traveling. But I do want to make sure that I have enough fabric to cover all of my panel so that I can stitch out all the way, all right? And then I can add my, uh, my pins or my spray basting and then I'm ready to go. All right, so our next step is to move over to the machine and I'm gonna have Deanne do that with us and we will talk a little bit more about that. Let me see if I can grab my, all my stuff. Okay, so you can follow me. <laughs> You ready? Okay. Go back up so you can get to it. There we go. OK, 
Okay, so Deanne is gonna take you to my machine and then she's gonna position herself so that you can see what I'm doing on the machine itself and the pieces I'm working on. Now, don't forget to grab your worksheets. So this is my new M7. And I'll tell you what, this is like a Cadillac. Uh, some days I'm not quite sure if I can handle this machine. It's just gorgeous. It's got all the bells and whistles. And I love it. Um, but I also use the Bella Sider. And that is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's over here. I'll show you what it looks like. So I have a wonderful studio here. Can you see my Bella over there? And I love it. So if I, and I bought that specifically because I wanted to be able to do larger quilts without having to kind of scrunch them underneath the arm of my sewing machine. Now this M7 is very large. It's got a really nice long throat here, which is good. Uh, my, my first machine that I got was, is a Bernina. Um, I can't remember the number of it, but it's a Bernina 153 Quilters Edition. And I thought that was pretty spiffy too. But it is small throated compared to some of the new machines that they have today. And um, <laughs> so from that standpoint, I had to really cram some of my pieces in it to quilt. It's not necessarily impossible, but it does take away from some of the fun. All right, so uh, prerequisite here is that you have your machine, whatever version you're using, whatever type of machine, is that you have it uh, threaded, you have a, a foot on it. Now I'm gonna keep this regular foot on it for now because I'm gonna show you some things that you can do where you don't necessarily have a, um, a quilting foot. Let me see here. And I will apologize, this is a new machine to me. I've done, I've done a lot of sewing, well not tremendously amount of sewing compared to some of my others, but there are times when I can't figure out what I'm supposed to have and my, my foot is right there where I need it, right here. <laughs> okay, and another thing I'm gonna do, so someone also asked me what size needle do I use? If you, uh, it depends on the thread you're using. And one of the things that I have, that I've heard recommended is there's a, um, It's a Schmitz, I think is how do you, is that how you Schmitz. Schmitz? And it's the it's the purple. It's the purple tip. Have you heard of those? They say they're great for quilting. No, I have not. Okay. I think it's Schmitz. Pretty sure it is. Hold on. Let me let me look at my receipt. Because I'm always I, I'm I'm not always sure about the type of needles that I should use. So I'm gonna change my needle because I was I have been doing some sewing and I wanna make sure that I have a very sharp brand new needle. Oh, it's a Janome. So it's specifically made for the Janome machines. And it's called a Janome sewing machine purple tip needle. I don't know what size it is and it doesn't say, but it was highly recommended. So I am going to undo my needle so that I, I want, and I would recommend that for you when you're doing your quilting, you know, free motion, that you start out with a nice sharp needle. If you don't, some of the things that can happen is your, um, your old needles can poke really big holes in it and um, you might have some thread problems. Okay, and what's also nice about this thing is this automatic threader. <laughs> Not that I've ever really had issues with threading, but it is very nice. I feel lazy. That's pretty slick. It is, it is very slick. Okay. All right. So I've got a new needle. I have bobbins that I have, um, that I've wound earlier from using this particular thread, the so fine that you have in your kit. 
And I'm going to, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ch exchange, oops, my machine is dirty. Oh, no. I'm going to trade out my, my little optics. Oops, <laughs> thank you. There's one right there. Okay, I'm going to trade out. I'm going to go ahead and put my other foot on. Okay, lefty Lucy, righty tidy, right? Yes. Okay, so as you can all see that I'm not an expert at sewing. <laughs> Come on. Okay. A uh, Janome purple needle is a 90 slash 14. Thank you. Oh, is that what somebody said? All right. Yes. Who was that? Is that G Chris, that did that? Chris Gibson Davidson. Oh, thank you, Chris. Oh, Chris, hi. She is a phenomenal teacher. Okay, I'm not doing this correctly. Can you, <laughs> maybe it's just me. Sorry guys, this just shows you my ineptitude. Is it right oh or my left? goodness. It is in there. There, oh, thank you. I was probably tightening it as I thought I was loosening it. Okay. So, and actually, Chris is an expert with these machines. Chris says hi there. Hey. <laughs> so, if you have any questions, Chris will be your expert to ask. All right. All right, so what kind of feet do you want to use when you are doing free motion? Um, it's a darning foot or uh, a free motion foot. The idea is that you want something that will allow you to see what you're doing. And um, on my machine, I have a button that's for quilting. And that sets my stitches for me, which is really nice. And let's see, I want to go here. Got to find my free motion one. Quilt. Okay, Chris, which one, which stitch do you recommend? On my quilting. I know there's one that I'm supposed to use. Is she giving you a comment? Okay, anybody at Martelli that knows the M7? I want to just make sure I do the, the correct one. Is G on here? Let me go back. On the web. Oh. What's that? Go into the quilting tab. Okay. I'm there. Go to the shirt icon. Ah, oh, okay. And pick piecing quilting. Piecing quilting. Thank you. Who is that? Chris. Oh, Chris, you're such a sweetheart. Thank you. Oh, no, Sharon. Sharon. Thank you. Okay, wait a minute. Quilting. Stitch. Top stitch. No. Pick piecing quilting. Piecing quilting. Hmm. Maybe I did the wrong one. Okay, I go to my quilting. Pick quilt. The shirt icon. Shirt. Hmm. 
Hmm. That's not on mine. Okay, go to the quilting tab. Sorry, guys. I knew what, so my problem is I don't use this enough that I uh, can't find it again. I know I found it before. Okay, then go to the shirt. Okay, let me, let me back up one more. Okay, we'll go here. See, this is the same thing where we're, oh, I think I have to go here. Free motion, there I go. <laughs> All right, thank you, I found it. Woo she's got it, everybody. All right, sorry. It's like, oh boy, how embarrassing. <laughs> oh well, you guys are loving me anyway, right? Are you yes. gonna forgive me for forgetting how to find my stupid free motion? <laughs> okay, now I gotta, I, I have my, okay, I'm gonna use my little Palm Pilots, Palm Paddles, because I like them. So many times when you're doing free motion stitching, you want to uh, bring up the, uh, the thread to the top. So that's what I'm doing here. I bring it up. And I always hook my scissors so I have them with me. And can you hand me my purple thing? It's on the pink ribbon. There we go. Oops. Thank you. That's good. Okay, I have my little helper here. You can use practically anything to pull this. So, so the idea here is you pull your thread to the top, and then you can bury your threads later. And then I'm going to go down here. All right. So we're ready to go. Now, if you look at me, I don't know if you can see what, can you back up a little bit? I want to show you. You want to position your chair and the machine. You need your, uh, your gas pedal for the machine. And you want to sit. Actually, I probably should go a little higher. Okay, so you don't want to scrunch like this. You want to have your shoulders back and just, you want it to be as natural and relaxed a position as you can. So, and when you first start this, once you bring up uh, the, the um, your machine, you want to sort of catch the stitch where it is and then just start. And so with your feed dogs down, now this is a hopping foot. So you see what I'm doing? I'm just moving the machine. So the first time you start, I would recommend you just kind of play. Get used to the feel of the machine. And as I mentioned before, you are in control of the stitch length because of how fast you move. Now let me stop here a minute. As you can see, I'm using these paddles to move my machine, uh, I'm sorry, the fabric under my machine needle. Um, that's the beauty of Martelli with their sticky, uh, their, their uh, magical fabric that sticks to the fabric and allows you to move the fabric easily. If you didn't have these and you had the gloves, you could do the same thing. Um, I really like the paddles because you can actually pull tension around it and get yourself in position. So when you're sewing, just relax, put your shoulders back, and then just move. So the first time, just play. I'm going to show you a couple things here and then I'm going to, so, and when you want to move the paddles, you need to stop, reposition. If you try to position the, reposition the paddles um, or your hoop or anything else that you're using or your hands, when your machine's moving, you stand a really good chance of messing up your stitching. So you might want to, you just stop and don't feel bad about stopping. You don't have to go fast. In fact, when I first started doing this, I was going like 90 miles an hour as I thought I was supposed to. <laughs> and somebody said, just slow down, relax. And I said, oh, okay. And it sure helped my quilting. So it is a journey. And as I mentioned before, everybody has to kind of get the feel for it and don't feel bad about not remembering where your quilting stitch is and things like that. But 
just practice. Okay, and the more you, you practice with your machine, the better you're gonna be. So move it around and just play. Get yourself a feel for your machine and how you are using it. Now, a couple things about tension on your fabric. This piece is coming down over the edge and it's getting pulled. So you wanna be careful when you're doing any kind of free motion quilting. If you have something hanging over the edge or you have a cat come and sit there because they don't want you to quilt, they want you to stop and pay attention to them, you probably can't do free motion quilting very well. Actually, I wouldn't say you could do any kind of sewing very well at that point. So try to keep that tension off. And so a lot of times I'll just fold it up to get it on, on your uh, table. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, good. Um, so get it up so it's not dragging. When you're doing a large piece, that becomes a bit of a challenge. And so if you have tables where you can actually just allow your quilt to lay and flow with you, that helps. If you don't, then roll it up and get it to the point where you are not, um, it's not pulling and dragging. So the dragging is a real concern. We have a question from Carol Grady, chair recommendations. Yes. I have a regular office chair that I don't think is good for me. Ah, um, okay, so an off, regular office chair. Okay, some of the key things, and I'm not a chair expert, but if you talk to some of the people at Martelli, they can probably make some recommendations for you. Chris would be a good one, and, and perhaps uh, Linda, and maybe G. Um, the idea is, if you can get one that's adjustable, now for me, I, uh, I, I'm the kind of person that sits on the edge of my seat, and I cannot, that's just me. Um, some people like to sit back. So the idea is, if you can sit back in your chair and be relaxed, that's good. I like to sit forward so I can see, and then, um, but I also constantly remind myself to relax my shoulders and flow uh, with my paddles. A chair that is adjustable height-wise is good, um, and if you have one, and actually I know people, I know some people who, you know those big balls, the big rubber balls, they use that and they love it. So it's really, it depends on what you wanna do, what you wanna use. An office chair would work if you had, if you had the ability to adjust it at the right height. Um, the idea is you don't wanna scrunch your shoulders up because you're too low. You don't wanna have them way down because you're too high because you wanna be able to see. Um, the idea with this is you are controlling where the fabric's going. So you want to see where that fabric is and where the needle is and you're moving the fabric. So key things are you want to be able to adjust the height. And if you don't have a chair that can be that adjustable, pillows. <laughs> Just add, add some pillows to it to help get, it, get some more some height. Um, but you also still need to be able to reach your pedals, <laughs> your, your, uh, your, um, power, your foot pedal. Um, and I'm trying to think, so Chris, anybody else out there that has any other recommendations for it? So to me, the key one is that you feel comfortable and you can be relaxed in a position. Um, also, <clears throat> take breaks, take plenty of breaks. I'd sew for a 15 minutes or half an hour and then take a break. Um, I do know that there are times when I've got a deadline and I'm trying to get this quilting done or if I'm on a roll, I'll just keep quilting and I usually pay for it later. I, I just get really tired. So take a break. Doesn't mean that you can't start again later. So don't rush this because then I think you'll be more happy with your results. Hopefully I answered your question. Good question. Yes, Martelli replied. Good. Says sell, Martelli sells a really comfortable chair. Great. And actually I think most sewing stores do. So, you know, Martelli's great, but if you want to if you uh, have one local that you would rather support, I'm sure they'd be fine with that. Although Martelli would love to sell you one. <laughs> and they've got some probably some pretty good deals. Okay, so um, again, just a couple of the key things, key concepts here is you want to keep tension. Uh, and this is also gonna allow you to kind of smooth some of these potential wrinkles out. And when you're sewing, just, Take a breath and just put the power on and move. 
So another reason that you're doing this practice piece is so that you get comfortable. And if you feel good, speed up a little bit. Okay, now I don't know if you saw that, but I'm starting to pull this way, so I need actually to have a little tension here because I was going further than what I had. So stop and move your paddles. There we go. Now, there are all kinds of classes that will talk to you about patterns that you can sew. For me, right now, I think the most key that you would want to do is just play. If you're interested in learning how to do feathers or stars that connect all the way across, there's a lot of uh, good videos, um, a lot of good books that you can, you can uh, get and practice. Me, I actually prefer something that's more um, natural. And I like to do stitching that kind of complements what I'm, what I'm quilting on. So for example, if I'm doing flowers, I want to follow the contours of the flowers. And then when I'm trying to push the background back, I want to do more organic things. But you can, you can do lines. It's whatever you want to do. So I'm going to show you something here. Um, can I ask you, Deanne, could you grab the, um, the paddle that is over there for me? I'm going to show you how you can use the paddle. Now, another thing about these threads, I know they're kind of a pain. Uh, you might want to just leave them, though, because or I know some people who actually uh, bury them as they go, and that way they're out of the way. And I know on a couple of my the latest quilts that I've done, I actually buried them as I went because I didn't want them in my way. Thank you, Dean. Mm -hmm. So these right here, now you have to be careful with these because of your foot. You have to have a foot that has enough height. And, and Martelli, uh, I believe that they, act, um, actually most machines have what they call a ruler foot that actually has a little wider lip. Um, can you grab me the Martelli one that's over there? The, the thinner one. It's the one that uh, has, has the gray lettering on it that I was using. Perfect. No, actually the one that's not in the bag. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. I'm going to show you using the Martelli one that they provided you because it's going to work really well for you if you want. So in addition to, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to move out. There we go. Now I am out of the way of my other design here. So can you see what I've done? I don't know if you can mm -hmm. see. All right. So if I set my ruler down, and use it as kind of a, a guide. Let me see if I can do it. No, I have to do it on this side. If I use it as a guide and I just go forward and use it to push, and I'm actually gonna grab my other palm paddle, and I'm going to use it. When I follow the ruler, it works really well. I meandered off of it a little bit, but see how nice you can do some straight lines with that? Uh, or if you want, um, I just, I start out by doing a line. It's a little bit more organic, but again, I'm not really worried about these things being so perfect. I just do a line. And actually, somebody told me one time, oops, I'm starting to lose my tension there, so I've got to stop and move my paddles. Uh, they said there's no such thing as an absolutely straight line in nature. So that's, that's my excuse for not having perfect lines. So here, I'm tending to get ahead of myself. I need to stop and move my paddles so I'm not ahead of myself when I'm stitching. So you can use a ruler or you can just be organic and add your lines. And I think that the, uh, the variations in your line stitching adds to the quilt. This makes them more interesting. And to be perfectly honest, once you finish the whole thing, nobody's going to go in there with a ruler and measure it. My key here is that you feel comfortable with you and the machine. And I, many years when I first started doing this, I was afraid of my sewing machine. And actually it didn't help that I ran over and stitched my fingernail one time and that hurt. So I was a little bit nervous. 
And so that tells. So what you want to do is realize that this is your friend. This is a wonderful piece of equipment, no matter what machine you have. And if I was to look at all of the stitching that I do on my quilts, on my pieces, and if I had to do those by hand, no way. <laughs> so this is my buddy. This is my little buddy. And I want to learn my machine and I want to, and even though this is new to me, I love it because all it takes is just a few minutes for me to get warmed up and then I feel really, really good. Okay, so what I would like for you guys to do is warm up with your machine and then I'm gonna give you a couple of different uh, things that I want you to do and then we're just gonna give you a block of time to do this. So I don't know if any of you have been sewing along as I've been demonstrating. For those of you who feel comfortable doing it, that's fine. So the next thing I want you to do is I want you to create a circle. And I would recommend, it doesn't have to be a perfect circle. If you want to take something and draw it before you do it, that's fine. But make an oval shape. And then I want you to come over here. And I want you to make a cylinder. And these can be free form, or you can draw them out if you want them to be a little bit more perfect. And then I want you to come over here and I want you to make a leaf. And have some fun drawing. Draw with your stitching. And realize that this is a Rhonda leaf. I am, I've got power. I can make my own creations. And then I want you to come over here and I want you to do a flower. You can use some of the pictures on your worksheet as, as uh, models. So if you want to take a few minutes and actually draw them out so you have lines to follow, or just create them on the fly, have some fun. Now, Notice where my hands are. I'm kind of moving further away from my where my needle is and I'm losing control. So just be careful that you don't get too carried away and stop and reposition. And then I'm gonna come here in the middle and I'm gonna make a circle for the center. And then I'm gonna come down and add my stem. So have some fun. Okay, now after you've done that, then you want to go in and you want to play a little bit. Let's play. Um, let's see, I'm going to add some. And you, your petals, and whatever you do, doesn't have to be the same on everything. I'm going to play with some different ideas for stitching. Ooh, my petal looks like a feather. <laughs> All right. Come in and add some fun. Ah, I'm going to add some cross, or some cross hatching. Now here, you're just kind of practicing trying to follow particular um, lines, trying to practice going over the same line so it doesn't show. Because when you travel, it's really nice if you can do that because then you hide the fact that you've traveled all the way to do something different. And even though this is kind of might seem kind of silly to you, this is developing some very good hand-eye coordination so that you feel more comfortable. There, see all my different petals? You see those? All right. Now I'm going to come over to my, I'm going to try to follow my line. Oops, I probably better move my paddles in a little bit. Follow my line as close as possible. Now another thing that's going to happen after you're done quilting, when you wash this or rinse it, you're going to find that it's going to puff up a little bit, and so it'll hide a lot of the things that you say, oh, I don't like that. Looks like I'm getting a little bit of knotting from, I'm probably stitching too, too many times in one place. So on my leaf, I'm going to come here and just practice doing some veins. So the practice that you did on your worksheet is going to help you 
feel more comfortable doing any of this. And because this one's so small, I'm not sure I need any more than what I've got right here. Yeah. Now, another thing I'm going to practice right here is I'm going to show you. There's all kinds of different uh, stitching you can do if you want to create backgrounds, push the fabric back. You can do what they call a meander. And I've, I've read a lot of articles where they say, oh, that's, that's just the lazy person's way of doing it. Well, I don't agree. It depends on what you want to do. There's another technique that they call pebbling, where you go around and you just keep doing circles and connect them and just keep drawing circles of different sizes. I don't like meandering, but a little bit different. about crossing my lines. I'm not worried about that. There are some people who, who take pride in not ever having a line cross. That's fine. That's what they want to do. I would actually not worry about that until you feel more comfortable with, with uh, free motion stitching. And then you might also want to try, this is a good stand too, and it's called echo closing. Basically just mirroring the line as you go around. And you probably should have a little bit more consistency in terms of how far apart if you want it to look good. So let's say, oh shoot, I wanted something here. Let's go, go back in and add another line. Okay? So your assignment now is to just start playing. And I'm going to give you 10 minutes or so here because there's quite a bit of things that I've, I've had you do. So the first thing I want you to do is play. Just start, figure out how your machine works. Now, for some of you who have done quilting before, free motion quilting, this might be very fast. Um, but I want those of you who are new to this, just play. And just, so the idea is give yourself an opportunity to not worry about following any lines, but experiment with the speed of, the, of your gas pedal. Um, how fast you're moving. So the idea is you want to move in a consistent manner. And probably the only way you're going to figure out what that is for you is to practice. So you may end up having some really long stitches. Those are probably not what you want. Uh, you want something that's a little bit more consistent. And then the other thing is, then if you can master them being the same consistency. But I would not worry about that because I like stitch lengths, different lengths, depending on what I'm quilting. So... Don't talk to me about quilt police, because I go to them. Um, all right, so first thing I want you to do is play. Get familiar with your machine and you and your quilting. And then try to do some, uh, some patterns that build on each other, just to give you an idea. Go freeform. And then once you feel a little bit comfortable with that, come down and create a circle or an oval or some sort of a roundish shape. Come over and create yourself a cylinder shape. Come over and create a leaf and a flower, and then come back and start playing with quilting with those. So we're gonna give you 10 minutes, and then I'll come back and check and see how everybody is. So the, the whole point of this is for you to feel comfortable about the free motion quilting. And <clears throat> for some of you, if this is the first time you've done this, you're probably not going to be an expert at the end of this workshop. Darn. <laughs> Darn. No, just please give yourself, be gentle on yourself. You know, we are all learning and um, it's okay because the next time you do it, it's going to be even easier and you're going to feel more comfortable. So give yourself a break, give yourself some fun and have some fun. Oh, another thing you can do is do a toilet paper roll and see what you're going to do on quilting it. So use this particular practice piece to really try some things. I would save a little bit because then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to practice some of the types of stitching that you're planning on using on your panel before we actually sew on that panel. So go ahead and do that. 
and we will touch base. If anybody has questions, uh, post them and we'll see if we can handle those. Um, but the big thing is give yourself permission to play and have fun. We'll be back to you. I'm just gonna let it stay right here on this and to give you some inspiration. <laughs>
you can watch what I'm going to do next. I, um, we'll wait if you want to, a little bit more time if you don't feel too comfortable. But please don't feel obligated that you have to start sewing on your panel until you're ready. And that actually brings a really good uh, point up. I'm going to show you some of my other panels. And if you are interested in any of the other panels, you can contact me. Um, you would get the verse or the or spirit through Martelli and the Eagle. And I have some other panels that you can purchase from me if you want to contact me. And then you just contact me through my website or Rhonda at RhondaDenny.com. Okay, so does anybody need any more time? All right, let's go ahead then, since I'm not seeing anybody saying, wait, wait, let's talk a little bit more about what we do next. So the idea here is that you practice until you feel pretty good about what you're doing. And what's fun is look at the back side, and that will also be a good indication of whether your tension is correct on your machine. And this M7 is just a dream. I love it. <laughs> I'm so, it, it was a little bit of a splurge for me, but I am very, very glad that I got it. It's a Cadillac. I think what I had before was a VW Bug. But Brenda I still Powers like asked, what was that? It was a clock oh, chiming the time. Actually, it was our front doorbell. <laughs> oh, it was the front doorbell. <laughs> um, and that may, that may be the package from Valerie. <laughs> Valerie, we figured out some other way to do it, so we're good. But I'll let you know. I'll, I'll contact you when I know for sure what it is. My husband's taking care of that. Okay, so uh, a couple other things I want to talk a little bit about is um, when you are done stitching, and this is just general quilting kind of stitching stuff. When you're done, if you have a machine that will tie it off and and cut it for you, that's great. If you don't, which many of the, uh, like if, if you're using the machine like I had my Bernina before, I'm gonna come off and say, let's, let's say I'm done. Now, I, I actually cheat a little bit. If I have some extra off the edge of my quilt that, you know, I talked to you about having a margin all the way around so that I've got my sandwich and my fabric and stuff bigger than what my finished product's gonna be, I'll just run my stitching off the edge and cut it. I don't have to worry about bearing, bearing threads or anything like that at that point. So, but if you want to be very precise here, if you bring your needle up and you grab your thread, get a little bit of tension loosened on this. Okay, so if you, if you loosen the tension a little bit, and I use my purple thing, but I just want a little loop and I hold it and I come back down again in the same place. I didn't want to move that. I kind of moved it a little bit. And then if you go up again, and I'm gonna raise the foot so you can see it. If you pull up on both sides of it, you can actually pull your thread up. And then when you cut it, I think my fingers are getting in the way, but the idea is now you have your threads at the top and you can tie them off and bury those ends, okay? There's a lot of YouTube uh, videos on this. It's pretty standard on how you do this. So it's just called bringing your threads to the top and so you can bury them. Brenda Powers says, I'm having a little trouble with the, tr with the trying to stitch back and forth in the circles or cylinders. Okay, okay. So, uh, Brenda, can you be a little bit more clear? Are, are you just, is it because you don't know quite how to stitch in it, or are you having trouble finding the lines and following them? Just give me a little bit more idea on when you say you're having trouble. Well, Martelli says, you know what they say, practice, practice, I was going to say, practice is what the key is. <laughs> yes, practice, practice, practice. And who knows, you might come up with a really neat way to stitch on it when, by, by experimenting and, <laughs> and practicing. And says LOL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Yes, practice, practice, practice. That is the key. All right, now,
before we actually start working on your panel, I know some of you say, oh, I want to get on my panel. I want it now, now. No, nope, let's wait just a little bit. We're almost ready. I want to think about what are we going to do on our panel. So if you are doing the, um, the, the spirit verse, depending on what you practiced on your worksheet, let me go grab that again and I'll show you. You want to now practice what it is that you decided you wanted to do on it. Grab these. And bring them back so you can see them over here with the sewing machine. Okay, so we had our worksheets, and here's my nifty plastic bag. Get it in there, run the right way. I took them out, and I shouldn't have. So the nice thing about having the plastic is you can actually have several variations of this, and then you just take them off and put them there so you can see what you got. Or you use your copies of it with all your drawings on it. Okay, so here we have our spirit. And let me get it lined up the right way here. <clears throat> I don't know if you can zoom in here. You would probably want to do a little bit more playing on, on your worksheet first. But if you say, okay, I think I know what I want to do, and you're comfortable in that, what you want to do at this point, now that you've, after you've done your worksheet where you're doing pencil or pen or ink pen to paper or plastic, to give you an idea of what you want to do, you want to come over here on the machine and practice some of the things that you think you want to do. So if you are wanting to gain some experience and practice in following some lines so that you can outline something, you can... Let me just grab one of my marker pens. So here's where if you have a, an ink pen, and it doesn't really matter if it's, uh, if it's uh, permanent or not, because this is just your practice piece. Um, the other key is if you're going to mark on it, uh, if you have a dark fabric, which we're using here so you can see your stitching, you might want to... Um, practice some of this on a lighter fabric so you can actually draw lines and follow. There's them. a little bit of glare. Oh, is there? Okay. Mm -hmm. I am going to just draw on this. Okay, so what we decided when we were doing this was that we wanted to do some stitching closely around the lettering. Not necessarily doing every letter but going around like this. So we were outlining it. So if I'm gonna do this on this particular panel, I wanna make sure that I don't cover up the lettering so that you can still read it. And okay, this is also gonna bring up another good um, question or, or another good point about what color thread do I use? Um, so what you are provided with in the kit is a neutral. And what do I mean by a neutral color? Um, it is a, solid fabric that it well, actually can also be variegated, but it's a color that tends to uh, basically uh, meld with whatever colors you have. And a neutral color can be a gray or a, a light brown. Um, white is not necessarily a neutral color, but what we've got here is more of a cream and that's considered to be neutral. Um, and I, I'm sure the definitions of what is neutral and what isn't may, may differ, but the idea is if I was to quilt overall with that color thread, it would end up melding with the fabric and not looking glaringly different. So it's, that's what they mean by a neutral. Um, if you wanted to have colors that would match your fabric, then that would, those stitches would definitely um, sort of go into the fabric and sort of disappear. You would still see the, the quilting if you look closely, but you wouldn't see them that much. Um, if you got a contrasting color, it would definitely stand out and you would see the stitching. So the challenge with something like this piece that we're looking at here is, I don't know if they can see this or not. Are we frozen again? Mm -mm. It says broadcast interrupted again. Oh, I must not be on the new one. Okay, um, so when we have 
Uh, I'm going to leave that because I might have to do something with that. Um, what we want to do is decide what, what you want to do on your particular piece. So in this case, we are going to just use a neutral. Um, you could possibly do it in different colors to see what you like in terms of the effect and then take the stitching out and, and restitch it. But what I want to do when I'm stitching is be careful that I don't go too close to the lettering here where I lose the lettering with the stitching. So um, I want to practice that. So on my particular piece here, I'm going to, uh, let me just say, I'm just, and you can use your particular panel um, as, a, as a template. But I'm, what I did is I just wrote some words here. And what I want to practice now, I want to do some specific practicing for the panel that I'm going to be quilting on. So in this case, I want to, first of all, bring up my thread. Like we're practicing good quilting habits here. I also have my Martelli tweezers, which are handy to have to use. And then try to go right back in the same hole if we can. And if you have a machine to hand go down, you can do it that way too to make sure you're there. And then bring it up again. Actually, I did that already. So I'm going to go back down. Make sure I get in the same hole. There. Okay, now I'm ready to start. So I'm going to practice here, coming and following. Now, here you can see that in some cases it's hard to see this lettering. So what I might want to do, until I get more comfortable or have a better visual, is just go around it, like so. You don't have to go really close, because what I'm trying to do here is just outline it so it pops. So here we're getting that kind of practice, and then what I can also do is I can say, all right, in addition to doing that, I'm going to want to do some echo quilting or some sort of a pattern in my background and play. So where you did it before on your worksheet with a pencil, you now want to come in here and try practicing the stitching. So I think you can probably see the benefit of doing this ahead of time before you start committing yourself to stitching on your panel. And what you've drawn in pencil may not look quite the same as what you're doing with the stitching because you're doing something with a machine and thread instead of just a pencil. Okay? So that's the idea, is give yourself something to practice with. Now, if I'm doing something with the eagle, I could draw on here. Maybe I want to practice my feather, my feathers. So I'm going to, I'm going to trace off my particular um, pattern. I'm just going to real quick do one here. And I know that I've got some feathers, so I'm going to just draw a couple of lines so I've got them. And I know my beak's coming here. Okay, so you just transfer some of this so you've got something as a pattern. And come in here and just practice the kinds of stitching that you think that you'd want to use. This will give you muscle memory. Or, if you don't want to do this, just go for it. <laughs> you say, nah, I'm just going to go. And I'm going to stitch on this. And you will probably end up with some very beautiful results, too. There are no rules. No rules at all. And if you don't like your stitching, you can tear them out and start over. 
Okay, don't get too far away from your piece. Keep your tension with your paddles, or you'll find that you're gonna start getting some really loopy things that happen. Okay? And again, I talked earlier about when you're doing the stitching, you wanna add some stitching and you can always come in later and add more. Okay, I'm also getting further away, so I've gotta move my paddles. Your decision about how much stitching you want to do is totally up to you. Maybe you just want to outline the whole thing and, and, and leave it at that. Uh, maybe you want to go in and do, add a little bit more detail to some of the feathers and some of the texture. It's stitching for dimension and we're just trying to add a little bit of pizzazz. So basically that's what we want to do. Um, and I'm trying to think uh, I don't know that I need to have you do some stitching because I don't have any ability, since it's a Facebook Live and it's just me, for me to show you anything other than what I've done. Other than what I can do is I can show you, I'm just going to, so in, in this case, I'm just going to come take my stitching off the edge of my piece. Moving my paddles as I go. And then if I do it this way, I don't even have to worry about burying my thread. I just say, okay, I'm done. And I can cut it and move on. That's my pre preferred way if I can do that. So let me show you just a little bit here. When you actually go to your panel, you've got it all sandwiched and it's just the same thing. You're just doing the same kind of thing except that you have the panel that will give you some guidelines. So if you feel comfortable enough, just go for it. Um, and if you look at the details on these panels, you can see where I stitched. And you'll notice that I didn't necessarily, I wasn't real exact. So I would actually recommend that you start off of the quilt, off the panel itself on the edge, and come down. And I would just start sewing. As long as you start it off the edge, you're good to go. And just make sure you hold your tension so that you don't end up having any wrinkles. And that's top and bottom. So if you if you have ironed it, then you've got most of the big wrinkles out and you just keep tension on it. So you keep coming here. And just follow the pattern. I just want to, can you, um, can you zoom in a little bit here? I just want you to see, look at how beautiful, beautifully this just <gasps> sort of melts. What's wrong? Oh, we're good. Okay, good. <laughs> That's not a word I like hearing from you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> or like uh, when you're in an operating, uh, an operating room, you don't want to ever hear the <laughs> word oops. <laughs> okay, so. All of these, the thread is just almost disappearing. And that's, that's nice. Now that, that's because of the feathers and the white that we were doing. So let's keep going here. So I'm actually just using, so any panel that you have makes a wonderful practice tool for your practicing free motion. Oops, now I'm, okay, my, I wonder if my bobbin. Let me get out of here. I don't know what it did. Ah, something happened. That's not good. Let me, uh... I don't quite know what happened there. That wasn't good. Oh, I know what it is. My thread started separating. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay. this being re-threaded quickly. Oh, it's so nice. I like that. All right, let me try this again. 
Now I can I can go in and pick that out later. I don't know quite what happened. I just make sure that my bobbin thread is okay. It wasn't something that I did. Well, I have plenty of bobbin thread. Get this rewound or re reset. Okay. All right, I'm gonna start over here again, just in case so I can make sure everything's working. Try that again. Now I know this machine, I'm supposed to just be able to start sewing, but I'm gonna see if I can bring that thread to the top. There it is. Let's make sure that that's set. Okay. So because of my old machine, I'm so used to having to do that, I just, I'm in a habit of doing it anyway. There we go. Okay, so we'll get that down. Find my paddles. So as I'm sewing, I'm actually pulling tension on this. Now here, you might have an issue with that dragging. So just try to get it where your panel is not dragging anywhere and get, and you will know it because your stitches are gonna start getting pulled and you'll find, oh my gosh, some, somebody's holding my quilt. It's the same feeling when you have a cat sitting on it, believe me. So all I'm doing here is just kind of doing some zigzag motions with the needle and the thread, doing some stitching here, and back where I wanted to be. So many times when I'm trying to travel on my piece, I use that technique to get off and on the quilt. And don't get too far ahead of yourself without holding your tension. I sometimes get ahead of myself. Now, if you use the hoop, you wouldn't have that same issue because you've got tension all the way around. And I'm, I've got it over there. I'm just using these right now. So Every one of the Martelli um, hoops or the different quilting tools that they have all are wonderful. And I don't use any one. I use them all, just depending on what I have available, what I, what I feel like that particular time. So I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. Actually, what I can do is show you afterwards on the back. Okay, again, I'm seeing where I'm not holding my tension well. You gotta be careful with that because you'll end up getting some wrinkles and you'll end up having them sewn into your panel and you don't want that. But you can always pull them out. Okay, so just go with the flow. And as I was mentioning earlier, um, any kind of a panel, you can find panels that your fabric shops. Anything like that would be a great tool for you to practice free motion stitching. Okay, I'm going to just cut this real quick and I'm going to show you what I actually did. So this one doesn't count because that was the, the error. So you can see some of the things that we did and I came here. I don't know if you can see these stitching here. I got a little big on my stitching here. Uh, quilt police might give me a ticket for that, but I don't care. So just look at that. Now let's go look at the back. So, ah, uh, now that's, I had a little issue there. I don't know quite that was. Um, actually, I think that's when I started having my issues there. Anyway, this is where I came and I, I did some stitching. Actually, this is where I had it. So you can see your stitching. So if you look at this, I've got, a, my stitches are a little long. That means that I was moving too fast with the pushing the fabric too fast. So this is the kind of thing that you might want to look at here. And I was getting in a hurry because I wanted to show you something before we were going to end the workshop. So that's a no-no. I mean, don't get in a hurry like I just did. So I demonstrated what you don't do. <laughs> so learn from me. But if you look at it, I've got some pretty good consistency in some of the others. And I would not worry about that. This is for your use. Most people who look at these kinds of things will never see that. And that's another point. We are all so self-critical 
And we don't give ourselves any, any benefit of a doubt or any recognition that we're learning. So please be kind to yourself. And so my mention of this is please have fun. Um, I think you're going to enjoy these panels. One of the things I want to do is <clears throat> I have a lot of other panels that are available, and you can get them from me. Um, I have several here I could show to you, but I don't know how much longer we want to stay on. Um, so my panels are very similar to the one that you see here with the eagle, but on my website there will be a PDF that actually shows, these are all the ones I have available now. These are all based on my work. And I've had people contact me and they just love them because they are, they give them an opportunity to uh, create something. So you can actually just quilt them or you can add them to a bigger quilt. So you can quilt them and just have them be a panel. So I have many different ones. And actually I don't even remember how many I have. I've got three, six, nine, 12. I've got almost 30 or so, and I keep adding some of the ones. Oh, and just to show you, I have Mrs. Peacock in the kitchen with a rope. And I have the golden moments that you saw up on the board. I've got the chameleon is also a panel. So if you see any of these that you wanna do in addition to the spirit and the, um, uh, the eagle, you're more than welcome to get them from me. Let's see here, what else? Oh, and I've got Henry. For those of you who may not have seen this one, this is Henry the goat. This is the guy you met outside. There he is. So, I also have another eagle, and actually, you know, the, the eagle is the one that got me into doing my panels. I had a very good friend who said, I want you to create panels from your work because I want to create these and put them in, um, in Quilts of Valor. And so that was what gave me the initial idea of doing this. And I was so thrilled when my friend said that. So she said, well, do, do a bunch. So here's the other eagle. And she liked these for Quilts of Valor. Okay, I think that we are done as far as the live Facebook for this. But thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. Um, keep quilting, keep free motioning, and have fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and enjoy. Have a great day.